minus 30 seconds. T minus 20 seconds. Coolest Reptile Network in the world. Welcome to Trap Talk Reptile Network, episode 461. I'm Big E, Top G, Villarino Reptiles. What's good, everybody? Hit that like button, so subscribe, hit that notification bell. That way you're on top of every Trap Talk. Okay, so you're probably wondering, right? Where's, where's the star of the show? Where's MJ? Well, MJ's recovering from knee surgery. Homie needs some rest, and uh, you know we're riding along with uh, riding along with us tonight's episode is the great David Dave Levinson. Dave, hey, what's up, big dog? That much, I appreciate it. Um, great intro, man. Happy to be here. Yeah, man, we were entrusted with the ship. Yeah, we're gonna mess things up real bad. I know it already. <laughs> Let's kick some ass today. I'm going to admit to everyone out there, I'm nervous in the mother. All right? So we're going to make some mistakes, but we're going to have some fun. All right. So you what? guys, go support U.S. Arc in U.S. Arc, Florida. Got it. You got to take care of your rights. You love the animals. They protect our rights. They keep us doing what we love every single day. Last but not least, this episode is brought to you by the OG Mark Bailey, one of my dogs, one of the pioneers in the game. Head over to his morph market at Mark Bailey Reptiles for some heat. And the chipper, what can I say about this? I love the product. Trust me, I use it myself. I'm one of the distributors in Florida, but the traps preferences, the Coco to go. It's amazing. You got to try it. So go to CocoDude.com, use trap promo code. Let's do that again. Promo code trap 24 for 24% off for the whole year. The vlog on the Coco is coming soon. And again, the Red Top Super Show. I've been there. I've seen it. Rami's killing it. The LA, Pef the L.A. Pepper is taking three buildings June 28th through the 30th. More info at reptilesupershow.com. That was pretty good. What do you think? I think we got <laughs> through it, man. <laughs> All right. Okay, so, so is it my turn? I, I get to do my little thing? Let's go, man. All right. So before we get started, um, you know, a lot of people today were nice enough to make some donations. It all kind of came together last minute, but we're going to try this raffle out tonight. Um, we're going to try not to botch it too much, but I think we're going to get through this just fine. Um, everybody who's interested in jumping in the auction or not the auction, the raffle, um, give a $10 super chat. You can give as many as you want. Every time you do, it's like buying a ticket. Um, you know, we got a lot of really great stuff. Um, you know, Darian um, donated a thousand dollars in roaches, one of his four foot cages. That's 120 gallon. Um, Canova, Justin was able to give us a thousand dollars, kind of set the bar real high early. Um, Run It Reptiles, um, they hooked us up with the gift card for their deal. If you don't know about Run It Reptiles, go give it a check out. Uh, what else we got? Um, Tony and Chris Davenport, or yeah, Tony and Chris Davenport hit us up last minute and want to put in um, five hundred dollars. Um, that's going to be help me out, buddy. That's that's uh, D Exotics and uh, Tony at Hardwired. Hardwire.com or it's hardwire okay, reptiles. Hardwire exotics.com. Exotics. Wow. And then I'm so you sorry. Got, <laughs> and then you got a two hundred dollar gift card from Villarino Reptiles, the villain, towards yep. all twenty twenty four production. Well, cool. and I might have forgot one. Yeah, oh no, Adeline and Chris, they gave us our package and um tiki geckos. Uh tiki Manny geckos. hooked us up with a real nice gargoyle. Um 
So yeah. And um, then we got New York work as well, right? Yeah, Adeline and Chris uh, hooked us up with a basket. I believe it's 10 prints for them. Um, I've almost collected all their prints, but I still got a ways to go. And then we got Chris at Sea Serpents. Yes, wow, look at me, I should've wrote this down. Um, Chris at Sea Serpents was nice enough to give us an 18, and 16 slot V18 baby tub rack. Um, he's gonna ship that to you for free, whoever wins that. And then we got Dubia. Yeah, I got Dubia already knocked out. Now right. I think we're set. Yeah, now we're good, I promise. Right. Now let's get rolling on this, man. I wanna talk to USR. All right, let's do this. Well, you've got the nationwide side. I got the Florida part. Um, this is going to be amazing. Uh, I want to I want to share something with everyone out there. I've been on every level of this game. I was a small hobbyist, and uh, you know now I'm a you know I've been doing this full time for about two years and part time for about six. What I would tell everyone out there is that it's very important for everyone to have a US Arc membership. Everyone, okay. There were moments in the past when I was really new and young that I depended on everyone else to have our back. We, I was wrong. Okay. So now that I'm on, I've seen every scale of this game. We, as a reptile army out there, we need to ensure we protect having the animals we love. And that is by you know donating to your lobby and your representation and having a membership nope. what, do you, what do you say about that dave oh uh, i say that's the truth man um you know i've been lucky enough to be around the us arc since the early days in the north carolina shows um you know i've always kept a close eye on it i might not always be um up to date with what's going on in the laws but the big ones i feel like i'm always paying attention to but um you know, we're very fortunate to have a thing like that in this hobby you know there's a lot of other animal hobbies that don't have representation and you know the laws will be coming for them eventually so you know it's good that we're prepared it's good that we got a bunch of guys that are willing to fight for us and you know, let's keep this going you know like i said i think it's gonna be good tonight i know we're gonna do this again let's get these donations in and um see how we do and then another thing i wanted to share with you guys they are our lobby every industry out there has a lobby we are we are fortunate to have two so we need to find they are the front line and they are taking care of our rights. You know, everyone's worst nightmare is losing other animals in a fire, right? You know, losing other animals to disease. Another nightmare should be that, you know, tomorrow the government says you can't have the animals anymore. What the hell is going on? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that should be your, your nightmare as well. So you have to fight that by putting your money where your mouth is so i'm preaching yeah respect what, you, what, what would you say dave uh at the end of the day you've been in this longer than me a little longer i'd say um we a lot of us did depend on others right oh yeah um none of us got there by ourselves i mean there's always been somebody we've leaned on in the hobby and like you said as a whole the whole hobby gets the chance to lean on us arc um, you know, like I said, we're lucky to have them. I think that's going to be good tonight. Um, you know, Elizabeth has a lot to say about Florida. And, you know, Phil's got a lot to say about the other 49. Um, I know we're going to focus a little bit on Louisiana early on today. Um, like I said, this is good. It's nice to be informed. Um, I don't always read the long messages on um, Facebook. I don't always keep an eye on those posts. I think this is going to be the way to let everyone know what's going on. This is easy. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, well, I'm excited uh, to have both the president of us arc with phil goss and the, the president of us arc florida with elizabeth uh elizabeth wisneski um just excited man um so i think we're go. going jamie if you want to bring in elizabeth with all due respect emilio you got a lot of work to do buddy i love you but holy <laughs> shit, fuck <laughs> Good. You ready for do do more in the future? Trap yes. talk podcasts? Yes. Man. Only, only trap talk. Exclusive. Yes. Exclusive. Exclusive. <laughs> oh. So stop calling us. From the spot, get the club to pop. When I come up with the crop, God love it, love it, or not. I'm hot from the hop to the club the spot. Get the club to pop. When I come up with the club the spot, get the club to pop. When I come up with the club the spot, get the club to pop. When I come up Get the club to pop when I come up Everybody, we do it Everybody, we do it
I got carried away. <laughs> <laughs> My bad. Oh, you're good, right, bud. Welcome, welcome to the show, Elizabeth. Um, Thank you very much for having me. Hi, we guys. Are we are honored to have you on. Um, talk to us a little bit about the successes that we've had the last year or so. I'd say eight months. I would say, yes, sir. That would be pretty accurate. Um, there's been a, definitely a change of tone in Florida. Um, I am optimistic, but I'm very realistic also. So we are seeing changes. The communication um, with the new executive director has definitely been a positive thing. He is actually communicating. He is listening to our concerns. He's listening to the stakeholders in Florida's concern. So that is very powerful, um, but we're very realistic. Change is gonna take some time and we need to see where it's gonna go. Um, an example of an issue that a lot of stakeholders have been having, and I'm sure you guys have heard about it. It takes forever to get a permit in Florida. Have you heard people complaining? Yes. Oh my goodness. <clears throat> they apply, it takes months. And when I say months, sometimes it's one to two, sometimes it's six to nine months. They're, some people are, their permits are expiring and they're having to renew and then they're renewing two months again after that. So we have had a very huge battle and I will say battle. Not only we've gone from the paper trail that we had to the online, that has been a total confusion also. Um, so about a week ago, last Tuesday, right before the FWC commission meeting, I went up to Tallahassee. I did meet with the executive director. So I met with Roger Young. We did walk. He toured me around the entire FWC headquarters, which was very nice to see. Um, and we went into permitting. So we said, you know, Hey, this is a huge hot topic. This is a problem. What are we, what can we do to fix this? He said, well, the problem has been, we one, we don't have enough people. So we have hired people. So we met three people that just got hired. So that was exciting. So that was a positive visual that I can relay is coming through. They are learning. They've been there a few weeks. They're getting the hang of it. <clears throat> he did let me know that the outcome and the goal that they're trying to see is that they can turn around a permit in 24 hours. That's We're going to hold their feet to the fire. <laughs> That's amazing because what I could tell you, on at least in my, on my, in my understanding, when they went electronic, we all thought it was going to be much faster. I Absolutely. Mean, it, you know, we expected it to be a little glitchy, right, like anything. Mm -hmm. But uh, I remember last year, my, my uh, permit actually uh, expired for a couple weeks waiting for mm -hmm. them. So, yeah, uh, I'm glad that you guys have uh, tackled that issue. Well, and then there's the second side. Like you said, we just went to the online. And I personally even dealt with an issue with the online. It's a, They're sending it out to another company that's handling the computer side of it, and they don't understand the permit. So there's a lot of misinformation that's getting out there. So that was a concern that we brought up. And so he's going to go back to the drawing board try to figure out how to educate those people better or how to streamline you to get to the appropriate people. So optimistic, but realistic, you know, it looks like we are going to see some change. Yeah, we're going in the right direction, which is uh, I'm very happy about because I, I'll admit to you, I was very, we were all scared, you know, mm -hmm. uh, we were worried, you know, at one point with that white list and the black list. Um, is yes. there anything that you want to say about the, the two lists? Absolutely. I mean, TAG was tag was moving through with the whitelist. Um, we were all attending the meetings. I was attending the meetings. We had several people from USARC and USARC Florida on the TAG committee. We were all fighting against it. And we had sit downs with the commissioner again. You know, I'm sorry, not the commissioner, with the executive director. I made several phone calls and tried to explain to Roger um, to Executive Director Young, I should say, what the problem is with the whitelist, what it was going to cause. We even invited him out to Daytona. So he came out and he saw the Daytona Expo. So he got to meet a lot of the people out there and see firsthand what the whitelist would do. So 
after several phone calls, he said, you know what? I think this needs to be tabled. We need to definitely put this on the back burner. This needs more homework. This needs more research. And I don't know if this is a good choice for Florida. So that is where it is currently at. So that was a lot of work with US ARC and US ARC Florida. And you guys, I mean, you guys don't understand how powerful you are. The stakeholders making phone calls, everybody getting involved, that's what's making the difference. I mean, we're a board and yes, we're out here fighting, but without you guys, we're not as successful. We're just not, we all need to work together. And you guys are so important to that key part of it. So thank you so much for all your support. Every single individual is important. That's something that uh, I've been saying to all my, my friends, all my, um, mm -hmm. everyone in the V unit chat, everyone in the trap talk chats. I mean, everyone at the shows, every single army, I mean, every single soldier, every single member is important, Correct. you know? Um, on, well, one more thing I, that recently Daniel was tackling, um, we had one FWC officer out of everyone, because let me tell you, they're mostly all very good, but mm -hmm. there was one officer that was unreasonable and trying to play. I mean, I hate to say it, but trying to play cop. Yes. Um, and you guys tackled that as well for us, right? We have, we have been definitely, we're putting it out there. You know, we're addressing the issues and, you know, I'll, I'll make the phone calls and I'll let, you know, I let the executive director know this is wrong. We're not tolerating it. And I tell Daniel, you know, we need to get that out there. We need to let everybody know what's happening because if everyone stays quiet, it's going to get brushed underneath the carpet and we're just not going to stand for that. We're going to stand for the rights of the reptile keepers and all the keepers. You know, I tell people all the time, they're like, will you just stand up for, you know, the reptiles? No, we don't. When we talk about these rules, they affect the birds, the fish, the exotics. We are all lumped together. Whether we want to be or not, we are. We're one. <laughs> Agreed. I remember that. Sometimes mm -hmm. we, we, we get, you know, we get the, the blinders on and we forget. But that's very mm -hmm. good that you brought all that up. Dave, any questions for Elizabeth? Yes. Yeah. Um, so down in Florida, like, does this come in waves for you guys, like the rest of the United States? Like, how is it? I mean, do you have new things being proposed constantly? Are you fighting in counties? Like, what is the fight like down there? I will say it does come in waves. I mean, we try to stay on top of it and we try to get ahead of it before it gets out of control. Um, because in Florida, we are not against regulation. We're against you know, not having a due process followed and against bad regulations. So let me just stress that too. So there are good regulations. I mean, we've in the past helped with good regulations when the CSP program um, was developed. We had our board members that were there. I mean, we weren't a board at that time, but they were sitting there with FWC working together and creating good regulations. So what we have seen is in the change of leadership prior to executive young there was a different executive director that had a different ideology and it was told to me directly in a meeting that if it can live and breed in florida they did not want it here so the ideology was passed down to the staff and so i think we are now trying to get people back into a reasonable due process and reasonable regulations and understanding we are a huge industry and we we don't need to just go away we need to work together you know we're not we're not here to destroy the environment we're not here to do all the crazy stuff that they are saying we want to work together and we want to create good regulations so that the industry can grow and flourish and yet we can still protect and do what we need to do for environment and conservation. Okay. So um, I guess it'd be a very big challenge because there's term limits down there. You know, you're always going to be doing what you're doing, but you're always dealing with new people. Um, people you have in front of you right now, you said you're pretty happy with. You guys are able to accomplish things together. We are communicating, yes, and we are seeing small changes. Again, I'm optimistic and very realistic, too, because are they where we want them to be? They're not there yet, but we're, we are still working. We're still fighting in legal battles. We are still, you know, staying on top of things. 
And believe it or not, just like you see on a federal level, Phil has seen too, every year, some senator, some House of Representative comes up with some bill. And that's not only it's in our state and federally. And this is where you guys come in again, because if we can get people to use their voices, because we vote these people in, guys, I hate to break it to you. We vote these people in. We are their constituents. So we need to use our voices to make sure that we're being protected. Well, those out there uh, that think that we could get comfortable, we never can. There's always an impending battle. So mm -hmm. that's why taking care of your, your lobby is so important and never letting your guard down. What would you say to that, Elizabeth? 100%. You are so accurate. It's not funny. Um, I wish it wasn't so, but you are 100% accurate. We do have to keep our guard up. We have to keep our eyes open and we need to be aware of what's happening around us. Yeah. That well, said, we are all also for responsible keeping. So we all out there have to be responsible and do the right things at all times and represent our industry correctly. That's another issue that sometimes we have, right? That is a huge issue. That is a huge issue. Um, and that gets brought up to me a lot. So as we are sitting there having these conversations and we are talking about, you know, good regulations and why we are the way we are and where it is, I mean, we get blamed for everything and it's not all of us. They're, they're bad actors. And I said this, you know, months ago to the executive director, there's bad in every industry. There's bad doctors, there's bad cops, there's bad lawyers, it's, there's bad teachers. We can go across every, every industry that's out there. But we don't hold the entire industry accountable for this, you know, one person. And we don't use them as, you know, oh, well, there's bad cops, so we should not have cops anymore. There's a bad teacher, we shouldn't have bad teachers anymore. But yet, we have someone that may have made a bad choice in a reptile industry, so nobody should own a reptile anymore. And it's Absolutely. it's very disheartening is what it is because yeah, I, they're amazing pets i agree and uh, i mean uh we're, we're getting bigger and bigger uh, the industry is mm -hmm. getting bigger and bigger so as, as long as we continue to get more membership uh we'll keep fighting and and I, I believe we'll keep winning too we will together we will yes together cool. and that's what i tell everybody this isn't a one-man show this isn't even a five-man show this is all of us as an industry coming together, working together and achieving one goal together. And that's to protect it and to grow and to flourish and to have the animals that we love. Think about all that, you know, I told the executive director the other day, think about all the kids that we're raising. Think about the next generation. We're, we're role models for the next ones coming up. We have to protect this and fight. We need to educate. What about the kids that have allergies and maybe don't have time for a cat or a dog? And the perfect animal is a snake or a bearded dragon. You know, there's so many things and we need to allow that to grow and to carry on into the future. Yeah, I, I agree with that. We all need to consistently connect back to that little boy and that mm -hmm. little girl, uh, that, that that little boy that Dave was once one day catching reptiles in the backyard. <laughs> and you know what? We need to... Uh, wor worry about that next generation being able to do what we're doing. Like, who would ever thought, Dave, that me and you, uh, we'd be doing this for a living when we we're, you know, when we we're catching reptiles and ringnecks in the backyard, lizards. Yeah. Uh, look at us now, Elizabeth, look at you, you know, hey. family reptiles. It's incredible. Uh, we, yes, we need to do our best. And uh, I, I love the fact that U.S. Arc and U.S. Arc Florida are combining more and more every day as well. What would you say to that? Oh my goodness, Phil's amazing. Um, I met Phil years ago. U.S. Arc was coming down to Florida and Phil was here all the time. God love him. And uh, we realized that we're ground zero. Florida is the, it's where it all starts. It's all the craziness really starts here. And it needs a, I say a full time. And although we're all volunteers and we all have jobs and we have businesses, it needs somebody that gives it a lot of attention. So we talked to Phil and Phil said, listen, I'll support you 100 percent. We'll walk together 100 percent. He is there for every single phone call, all of our meetings. He is still involved, but he lets us as a board take care of Florida. But I promise you, he's on all of our calls and he's a part of everything. And I thank him more than you know, 
because there's a lot of times that we're like, oh my gosh, what's going on? And the first person I call is Phil. So, and then, you know, we'll have a board meeting about it and Phil will give his two cents and we all start talking about it. But hundred percent, Phil's a, Phil's as much as part of US Arc Florida as we are as part of US Arc Florida. He's amazing. Stronger together, right, Dave? What do you think, man? Hey, always stronger together, bud. Um, yeah. Um, so some people don't know a lot about the whitelist or the blacklist. Um, do you want to give just a little bit of a detail on what that was and what we avoided? Sure, absolutely. Um, FWC proposed what we call a whitelist, and that whitelist would have been everything that was allowed to be sold and what was not allowed to be sold. So if it was on a list, gosh, I was thinking I even probably still had a copy of it around here, um, but it was very minute list. And in fact, all monitors were not on that list. So basically they were giving us a very small list of 10, 12 species and then trying to add to it. And we would have had to prove that if these animals would have, could have got out, that they would not have been able to be established in the state of Florida and they would not have hurt the environment. So all that studies would have had to been done and it would have been on us as stakeholders. And if they didn't approve it, then they would never be allowed to keep them in the state of Florida. So that very small list would have been the only thing that you would have been able to keep. Well, okay. And um, when you mentioned that there was going to be a fee per animal, because there would have to be a study done per animal to decide whether or not you could or couldn't keep it. Wasn't that, do you know about how much that was going to cost per animal? I think I heard a couple thousand, few thousand. It would have been more than that. It would probably been closer to $10,000 because you would have had to hire a biologist probably through a college or a university. And then this could have taken, you know, a couple of years to even figure it all out and get all the studies taken care of. Also, there would have had to been impact studies taken into account. So you would have had to have an economist because if they did get out, what kind of damage could they do? What was the expense would have been to eradicate them at that point? So this could have been very extensive, and I would say it probably would have been more than ten thousand dollars. Well, well, that's that. That would have been how many? I, I remember there being at least a hundred animals on that list, right? Maybe more. That they were prohibiting. Yeah, two hundred. Oh, they actually no. They actually just had a list of where they were starting. Oh. So every it kind of they were taking everything away and give us a very small list to start with. Hmm. And then the blacklist was immediate, right? Mm hmm. Okay. Yeah. A little bit crazy. I mean, it was when we started talking about it, we were like, it, it would, it would have eliminated the industry in the state of Florida for sure. Yeah. Way overreaching. Uh, mm -hmm. It had to be defeated. I mean, Correct. I, I still can't even, fathom the idea <laughs> thank thank it, the lord <laughs> it, it is it, it was scary we were preparing for another battle i can tell you that that i'm very thankful that we did not have to do at this point in time yeah anything you see in the foreseeable future uh that you're worried about at the moment no um we don't see any really hot fires except for and we do have a bill in house um, that does not seem to be moving very much, but we are keeping a very close eye on it. And so that would be the only thing. If it started to move, we're going to be calling you going, Hey, but at this moment in time, it hasn't even seen committee. We're coming to the end of session. So I'm optimistic that I've been told, I have been told that it's not going anywhere, but I was also told that with the last bill, but I am optimistic since we are at the end almost the end of session and it has not been heard yet. So it's looking like it won't be, it won't move anywhere this year. Okay. Um, are you able to elaborate on that or is it best not to talk about this till something's worth talking about? Um, I can, it's a, uh, it's a bill that would prohibit the sale of cats and dogs and it would also prohibit the sale of different reptiles. So with that being said, like I said, I, I'm trying not to get everybody. It's on our website. It's on our Facebook page. But session literally ends on March 8th. So I think we're pretty safe at this point in time not to have to worry about it. They, it would have to go through three committees and be voted on. 
and we're almost to the end, so we should be clear. Um, I don't know what mm -hmm. they're on, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> aside from the reptiles, that that's not going anywhere. I mean, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, so a lot of times with um, builds, a lot of times they'll slip something in the backside, maybe something reptile related, maybe something completely unrelated to the build as a whole. Um, do they give you guys a heads up when that kind of stuff happens, or is it up to you guys to actually go through and read all this stuff, just see if we're mentioned at all? It's up to us. We don't usually get a heads up. Um, we have lobbyists involved. Um, we have programs that we watch everything that t trigger things. Actually, Phil watches that a lot on the federal level, and he sees those things come up quite often. But it is up to us. We do not get heads up. Um, how do you like your come job? On, Dave, so Oh, I love it because I love, I love helping people. Um, and by the way, I do this for free. All of our board members do. We don't get paid a dime. So it is a job that we do out of the kindness of our heart. And I do love it. But golly gee, I can tell you there's a lot of nights that I've lost sleep over it. A lot yeah, of nights that we've lost sleep. Well, what I can tell you is that we are blessed to have you and your husband, Scott. Scott is a, a very dear friend of mine. We've been together all the time. Yes. I'm finally getting to know you a little better, uh, Elizabeth. But uh, you guys are, we are in good hands in Florida. I'll tell you that. You guys are like Thank you. top tier, top notch, uh, top G's in Florida. I'll tell you that. <laughs> Thank you. We have an amazing board. So um, there's actually nine of us on the board and we're a great team. We all have different thought processes, which I think really brings a lot to the table. We have different backgrounds. I mean, we have a vet, we have an importer, we have breeders, we have the good old timers, we have the salespeople that, you know, Eric from ZooMed, of course, is on our board also. Um, we have people that are on the business side of things. So it's really neat when we come together, sometimes. <laughs> It does. We come out with great output, but sometimes getting to that great output is like, that was supposed to be a 15 minute call and we're two hours in trying to figure out what's best and the best way to handle things for everybody. Well, yeah. Shout out to Eugene Bassett. Yes. Uh, shout out to Michael Cole. Mm -hmm. Shout out to Daniel. And yes. I think those are the names that I, re I can remember. We got Amir. Don't forget Amir down there. And we got Amir Brian Tatani. Love. Yeah. Billy Healy. Yep. And we've got Ivan Alfonso. He's one of, he's our veterinarian. So we do, we have Chris at Sea Serpents. Can't forget Chris either. So we have an amazing team. A dream team. It yeah. is a dream team. I'll give you that. Yes. Yeah. And I couldn't do it without them. They're amazing. They make me crazy sometimes, but I couldn't do it without them. <laughs> yeah. So, Ooh. all right, gentlemen. I thank you so much for having me on tonight, but I have been up since three o'clock in the morning traveling. We appreciate you very much. Thank you for all you do in Florida. Thank you for keeping keeping the lights on and for keeping our passion going. Absolutely. And thank you. Invite us anytime and we'll love to share stuff with you. When we have things coming up, I'm going to be calling you. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, thank, thank you, you again, guys. Martin. Thank you. Have a great night. You too. We have to call Jamie to take her down. Uh, we, bro, we are in good hands in Florida. I'll tell you that. No, for sure. Um, I remember seeing family reptiles at the shows back in the day when I did a lot of vending in the Southeast. So I was living in the Carolinas. Um, you know, I always enjoyed seeing them at the shows. I believe at the South Carolina shows back in the day. Um, you know, it's cool to see people like, you know, years later and what they're doing in the hobby, especially, you know, taking big steps like that, like they have. Yeah, man, they're doing amazing. Um, I'm, I'm glad I could call them friends. Uh, you know, we, we, when we vent together, we do the whole, we take care of that pet level hobbyist a hundred percent. They like, let's say they buy a snake from me. I go and I get with Scott and we get them the whole setup. We get them what they need. It, it's, it's, it's great, man. It's amazing. That's cool, man. So how is the vibe you find at the shows? Like, do you think there's, is there a lot of chatter at the shows where you guys are discussing laws when you're in Florida? Is it something that's always on your mind or, you know, what's the vibe like down there? I, I'm going to admit I brought up the fact that, that uh, we feel good right now because we defeated those lists, but we just can't keep the, our guard down. I, I think everyone's uh, breathing a sigh of relief right now. 
uh, in Florida. I, I mean, I can't lie. We're all for, focused on the market and, and uh, you know, uh, you know, kicking butt and, and trying to do the best we can out there, you know? Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, when it comes to the laws, you know, there's really no getting around. There's always going to be something new that's going to get proposed in the hobby. I mean, a lot of that's out of our control. And, you know, what we always say is, you know, handle what is in your control. Um, but, you know, Florida, man, um, you know, Florida's always scared me. Um, you know, I don't mean to go negative, but I've always said that if we lose Florida, it's only a matter of time before we lose the rest of the United States. Um, you know, those laws will trickle into the rest of the states. Um, so, you know, backing Florida, doing a lot for Florida, honestly, is doing a lot to help everybody out. Um, you know, it's setting precedence when they start passing laws. Yeah, I mean, to some say we're, we are the epicenter, you know? Yeah, uh, the Mecca. Yeah, ground zero. So, I mean, it all starts here and, and it could, you know, it could, it could work its way up, right? No, for sure. Um, hey, so to jump back to everyone who's listening, um, so we're going to have like 10 minutes, 15 minutes of banter. Um, nothing too crazy. Um, we're going to go through some of the super chats. Um, like I mentioned, all the money tonight's going to be going to US Art Florida um goss has recommended us sending the money to them and we're happy to do so um but you know through the super chats make sure you get some questions in there anything you might have that we can address at the end of the episode and like i said any super chats gets you in the raffle minimal just ten dollars that's all we're asking for that's going to get your spot on the ticket and you know like i said there's some really cool stuff for giving away in the end but um emilio bud Shit, we got a couple minutes here. What are we gonna do so we don't lose everybody? Well, gotta... I want to congratulate everyone in the chat. Uh, we have reached a thousand dollars in super nice. chats. Awesome, that is keep amazing. You guys are amazing. Uh, let's keep it going. Can't wait to see who wins this stuff later. Uh, we got we got some amazing stuff for everybody, so it's gonna be fun, man. Well, oh, hey, man, we got to get this pace up, man. I need a little energy out of you here. Um, so tell me more about the Florida scene. Like, uh, have you been able to make it to any of these meetings? Like, you know, what have I you made been it, doing? I, I made, made it to the, the really important meeting in Miami. Uh, I, I didn't make it to the one in Gainesville, but the Miami one, uh, it was, it was, I was next to Steve and Jeremy Bod. We were sitting there listening to everything. It's, it's, uh, it's nerve wracking, man. That was my first meeting. Uh, but, uh, we came out and, uh, it, 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 man, it was, it felt great. Uh, when things got, I think things were th that day they paused and said they had, they needed more time. And, uh, I, I, I don't know, man, it was great to be part of it, you know? So do you feel like we're being taken serious when you're at these things? Do you feel like we're just like passed by, they want to just get through us out of the next thing, or do you think we're, you know, making you know, th good things happening? Yeah, I, I believe so. Uh, what I would tell you is that they at first thought we were just going to be an angry an, an angry mob and we were not that and uh they they listened and uh the new leader was there uh listening to uh the prior one i think his name was rodney mm -hmm. I, I don't remember fully uh but yeah man he he uh he gave us a clean slate from what it looks like and uh it feels great good good um Jeez, man. We didn't think this through. This is going to be a long gap. We should have some better plans for this, man. Okay, should so we roll with some uh, super chats uh, and do some questions for a little let's, bit? Let's, let's answer some questions, man. Some super chats. Yeah. Are there any let's questions? A little bit. Okay, so let's look. Let me see. Let me see if I get some questions here. And by the way, guys, we appreciate you sticking through. This was planned, not planned. All happened last minute. We want this to be a good thing for everybody. Honestly, looking forward to getting Phil on here. Um, you know, the discussion he's going to talk about Louisiana. Um, you know, I've heard some rumblings about it. Um, you guys know about a year ago, we had the laws passed in Georgia, um, with Burmese pythons. I don't know if that affected Tegus. I feel like Tegus were on that list. Um, and, you know, like we were talking about earlier, um, you know, a lot of these laws, I feel, trick a lot of Florida. Um, the neighboring states are always the ones that get looked at first, and then it keeps on pushing north. Um, I don't know if you guys remember some of the old studies back in the day where they made comments about Burmese pythons make it up to like the Ohio River and talks about them being, you know, that they could actually survive up there. Um, you know, like I said, this is kind of like the story that's old as time in this industry. Um, I've got old Bavaria magazines where it talks about it back in the 90s. Um, you know, these laws are always being proposed. It's scary. Um, I know I personally moved my collection around back in the day, got out of my boa constrictors, which I hated to do. Um, but I was too afraid to be running the risk of having a species that could possibly have bans in the nation. Um, and, you know, like Emilio said, man, this was kind of always the dream. 
um, you know, the idea to work with animals and actually make a living doing it. So, you know, I definitely made decisions early on that affected my collection today. Um, and I'm sure there's been other people along the way that have done the same thing. Uh, what would you say about uh, what happened with the berms in Georgia before uh, Phil comes on? Um, well, so I know it all happened fast and I wish I um, had a little more information on it. Um, I spoke with Matt, I spoke with Bob Boo about it. Um, and it sounds like, um, now what I had heard, I believe it was a virus or something that could be passed on from a Burmese python to a Eastern indigo. And because they're trying to bring the populations back up in Georgia with the Eastern indigo, they said, we got to ban the berms just to stop the disease from passing. I believe that's what it was, um, like the kind of loophole or the way they could have went after it. Um, you know, early in the day when the laws were coming up in Florida with the Burmese python, I believe it was the cattle ranchers versus us because of a heartworm or something that could have actually been passed on from Burmese pythons to cattle. And they made it seem like it was going to affect their industry and it very well could have. Okay. Um, but, you know, it's really tough or not so much tough, but, you know, lawyers always find a way, um, you know, there's always something that you can bring up to win your case. And like I said, the Eastern Indigo thing, if that's the way they went about it, which I believe that was the truth, um, you know, it was clever. Um, and, you know, that's one thing that makes it tough for what our fight is. Um, and, you know, we were going to lose something down there. I really hate to say it, but, you know, the early U.S. ARC auctions. Um, you know, I remember Andrew White talking in front of everybody, and I remember early on he made the comment that we're going to probably lose the berms to save everything else. And I remember the Burmese Python guys in the room, Sam was there, um, you know, they got angry. Um, you know, they thought that everything we were doing was to save that species. And for the most part, it was kind of looking at the hobby as a whole. And, you know, I hate to say it, sometimes there is a sacrificial lamb, and we've seen that. And the Burmese pythons kind of have been the sacrificial lamb ever since the beginning. Yeah, but, but let me ask you this: uh, Are are eastern indigos also permitted in Georgia? Are I mean, do they have the same limitations that we have in Florida? We're not even allowed to breed or have eastern indigos to save the wild population. I mean, I don't understand that. That seems uh, like an excuse to me. Well. I know they've re-established them in different areas. Um, I know in a lot of the states in the southeast, they've tried re-establishing them. Um, I know I've read some studies in Alabama where they're just starting to see them finally in the wild after reintroducing them. Um, so, you know, every state's going to be different. Now, that is a really tough species. Um, you know, of course, if you're going to buy one, I believe you need a federal permit. Um, you can't cross state lines without it. Um, you know, it's definitely a species they're protecting. Um, you know, I don't really see anything wrong with that. Um, you know, I was even talking, I watched something with, I think, RFK talking about um, the Redwood Forest and how they were able to save it because of a endangered owl that they claimed needed that forest. So they brought the owl up, they stopped them from um, going in and chopping down these trees, and they saved the forest. Now, that owl might have been able to live in a different environment, but, you know, really all this eastern indigo thing is, is you know, thinking outside the box on attacking a law. Yeah, I mean, I feel for the guys that lost, um, you know, that lost the the right to to breed their animals. Are are they allowed to keep their animals at least? Are they grandfather grandfathered in to keep them? Um, I believe it was going to be they needed to be microchipped. Um, I don't know if there was going to be limitations on how many the keeper can hold on to, uh, but I do know that there was going to be a microchip that was going to be necessary. Um, I'm sure there's going to be some smaller pet owners that aren't necessarily going to um, register their animal. And, you know, the repercussions will be the repercussions. And the reality is, if you're not in the hobby, you might not even have known about that law passing in Georgia. Um, and, you know, I've, I talk to a lot of people, so, you know, I get to hear about little things. Um, there was a pet tax they were trying to have in Colorado that didn't pass. So I want to say it was maybe $25 a year, you had to register for any animal in your home. Um, I heard something about a law in um, Arizona where they were gonna make it illegal to drive an animal around in your car, dogs, cats, reptiles, whatever it should so happen to be. Um, and these little things pop up a lot. I know there's some stuff going on in Michigan that might not have passed, um, but you know, I think one thing where government is getting smarter in this is you know, early on, it was one fight over everything covering 50 states. Now I find over the last uh, 10 years, um, 15 years, is individual states are coming up with their own laws, their own regulations, 
and it has us kind of running back and forth compared to having one big fight that we can unite, uh, unite behind. So I do think this is always going to be tricky for this industry. And I think anybody working with animals in any way, or as, you know, it's going to be regulated as long as time goes on us doing this. Um, but yeah, New York, what they passed a law a couple of years ago that made it illegal for pet stores to sell dog, cats, and rabbits. But the purpose for that was to try to crack down on puppy mills. So yeah, like I said, there's always a lot of stuff going on. Um, you know, I know we're not always reading the um, Facebook post about this kind of stuff. I know that I don't always read them. I usually call somebody else and they give me the clip notes so we could talk about it, which I kind of prefer it that way. But um, yeah, like I said, having, um, you know, I'm looking forward to learn a lot of details about this Louisiana. Um, you know, a couple of the breeders down there brought it up to me. It sounds like it's pretty bad. Um, and it sounds like it might be one of the more important fights that we have right now. And then what I'll tell you is uh, the more I've been out there and I've seen more animals like albino Burmese pides, Burmese pides, my God, man, uh, I, I wish I could have those animals. I'm, I'm, look, I'm not a giant fan for the most part, but I love berms. They're beautiful. Um, like, you know, the super dwarf retic that I was messing with at MJ's for the whole weekend at the show, man, I wish I could have that animal. Um, it's just a shame, man. It's a shame. Well, you know, what else can you say? No, I really, for sure. I really feel for those guys out there, um, that, that, you know, got affected by this. Um, this goes without saying, I'm going to ask anyway. Um, I would imagine that they can't breed the animals and even ship out right of the state. Um, no, I think at this point they it was completely shutting down the um, breeding and sale of um, that species in the state. Um, you know, I'm sure when these laws did come up, there may have been some guys who just got up and left the state if they had the resources. I'm sure there were some guys that probably put their berms in somebody else's hands to allow them to work with their projects in another state. Um, you know, I find in this industry, um, you know, we're resourceful. Um, if there's someone else that, you know, we can give our animals to to help us out, you know, there's always a friend out there wanting to help. But, um, you know, what the different guys did, I can't say for sure. Um, you know, I've only spoke to at least one, maybe two of them about it. But, you know, it's tragic. Um, like you said, there's a lot I like about everything in this hobby. But, I, you know, we've always noticed that, you know, it's the venomous stuff. It's the larger constrictors that you're going to come back and maybe bite us. Um, you know, I'm not throwing anything under the bus for each their own. Like you said, I would love to get into the albino burn project if I had the opportunity um, you know, the retic projects are absolutely mind blowing what they're doing nowadays. The fact that they're incorporating super dwarf and everything. Um, I love all these species. Um, I just simply know my limitations. Oh, and scrubs. Love the scrubs, buddy. And they're coming back Lucans, strong right now. Lucans that, that homeboy has in his collection. Man, I, I still remember messing with them. They're, they're incredible. You yeah. That, that's the hardest thing about this hobby, especially if you're a passionate person about the animals. Um, you know, every day I go to the show, I, I don't spend that much time looking at ball python morphs anymore, but I'll find a rosy bow minutes. Um, I don't know. I'd I wish I could work with everything. Um, I'm sure over time I'll have the opportunity to as long as the laws allow us to. But, um, you know, this is just the whole point that we're talking about today. Like, you know, in understanding what's going on around us, um, you know, be optimistic, but be real about it. Um, you know, these things are sometimes out of our control. Um, and, you know, we don't necessarily have somebody on our side. Um, you know, our fight is just us helping each other. Um, you know, fortunate that we have people that are willing to volunteer their time. And, um, yeah, like I said, this is, um, we're going to be, as long as you're in this hobby, these discussions will be going on. Yeah. Yeah. And, and again, it's an eye opener for everyone out there that doesn't have U.S. ARC membership or U.S. ARC Florida membership. You can lose your rights. So I would advise everyone out there, get in to US ARC and US ARC Florida. I mean, every year, make your donation, be a member. You know, it, it hurts, man. It hurts when, when we lose these battles and we lose what we love. You know, if you guys could go out there and buy, invest in, you know, thousands of dollars for, you know, whatever reptile um project that that you want why wouldn't you just also protect your investment by joining your lobby what do you think about that dave no for sure um i mean here's the thing 
it's not that we're lazy people. We all know it, but we don't always stay on top of things. Um, little things like that. Sometimes we need the people around us to encourage us to do it. You know, Emilio bringing it up and saying, you know, this is something we can all do. Um, you know, it's necessary. Um, we all need our friends around us convincing us to work a little bit harder because, again, some of us can be a little lazier than the others. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, I bring you Phil Goss. You got Phil yeah. Goss first? Go. Oh, buddy. The big dog. Oh, thank you, Phil, for showing thank up. Right right I'm on here. If yeah. only I was as sexy as Davey, David Levinson. Man, that, that uh, <laughs> Look at that jawline, Superman. You don't even got to do a thing over there. Yeah, I got I to gotta start getting a little baby beard in so I get my jawline back, though. Oh, that's just me covering being a five. It happens, man. It's getting old stinks. Oh. Uh, I, my sciatic nerve, buddy, I pinched it the other day trying to lift somebody over my shoulder. No good. I'm going to be in a lot of pain when this is over. That's, that's not something I'd recommend doing on a daily basis, that people lifting stuff. Yeah. I, I thought I knew what I was doing. I was trying to act tough. We'll get into it after the podcast, though. <laughs> but um, Way to not be successful. Hey, you know me. 50-50. Um, so, um, tired. Everyone got tired of hearing me and Dave, man. They want to see you, the star of the show. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody, everybody wants to see me. Wait everybody a... wants. Um, so, Phil, let's go. <laughs> okay, man, go ahead. Where are you at right now? What you doing there? Break it down for us. A fabulous place called Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And what do we got? We got the Herp Show this weekend. So, U.S. Arc is going to be there because you mentioned it a couple times earlier. I was kind of trying to listen while after Elizabeth took off. So we got a big herp. We call it an overhaul regulation of their herp regulation down here. And I mean, it, it's a lot to it. I mean, we <laughs> just highlighted it on our website, which you can go and look at just usarc.org. Scroll down, you'll find the Louisiana regulation. And But just highlighting it and breaking it down is still a whole lot of words. So probably anyone outside of Louisiana is not going to want to read through it. But again, it was, I think, 44 pages is how long the regulation is. So we just went through and put just the highlights, um, but it does quite a bit. So it's, they already have a regulation in place that you have to get a permit for any snake that's over 12 feet long. So one of the main changes we're concerned with is it makes it any snake that can reach over eight feet long now, and you have to get it even when it's a baby. So, you know, if you got, a dwarf species of boa constrictor or reticulated python that may not even get eight feet because it's still at the same species level, you would still have to get that permit for a crawl K boa or a Sonoran boa that, you know, may only get four, four and a half feet long. Um, so there's some issues we're trying to address and then we're going to be at the Herp show this weekend. And where the heck is it? Uh, Gonzalez. So a little bit South of Baton Rouge and collecting signature petitions. We're going to update our alert this weekend, so make it a little bit easier for people who haven't yet, even though we posted that alert almost three months ago. If you haven't taken a minute yet to copy and paste that sample letter, we'll have another way that you can at least send an email in and then hopefully collect a whole bunch of petition signatures and go on from there. Oh, cool. Um, any more details about that law? Is it pretty much just permits to keep? I mean, that be something where when we sell an animal to the general public, we have to confirm they have a permit. Like what will be the breeder's responsibility of things that this move forward? Yes. Yeah, so it's so, like I said, already in the state, hopefully everyone who's breeding and keeping, let's just say reticulated pythons, you know, if you're breeding them, you probably have animals over 12 feet. So you probably already have that state permit. So that part of it isn't going to change a whole lot, except currently it's legal to keep Burmese pythons and breed and sell berms. But that's one of the species that would actually be listed as prohibited is the Burmese python as well as all tegus are on the prohibited list, green iguanas, savannah monitors. So there's quite a few lists. Again, we've got it all right there on our website. So there will be some species that are currently legal to breed, keep, sell. They're going to be listed as prohibited. Then you wouldn't be able to do those anymore. For other species like the reticulated python, you would have to get permits no matter what size the animal is. And again, there would be some other restrictions. Um, there's some new caging requirements. And there's also a list of species that are going to be listed as restricted in the state, which you have to get permits to keep. And some of those are pretty crazy. Brown and Oles. Um, there's a Rockagama, Peterson's Rockagama on there. Uh, another species, curly-tailed lizards, I want to say, are on there. I can't remember all of them, but some, you know, pretty common and just innocuous species that you're actually going to have to get a permit to keep them in the state. So 
and a whole lot of changes on turtles and native species. And again, it's, it's quite, we call it an overhaul because that herp regulation hasn't been looked at for years and they're making a ton of changes to it. Okay. Um, is that somebody new in charge that's just, you know, adding to it or how did that end up going this way? Again, it's just something that, you know, states do this on a regular basis. So if your herp code hasn't been looked at for 20 or 30 or possibly 40 years, you know, it just, that's something that comes up in the cycle. You know, most states will have a schedule or even the federal government will have a schedule that they want to look at a certain regulation every 5, 10, 15 years, whatever it is. So I'm guessing it just came around to the cycle and then some of this stuff got proposed. And now we're going in and trying to remedy the situation to make it as appeasable as possible to the people there in Louisiana. Okay. Um, so I feel like these conversations always start with the Burmese Python. Um, tegus again is another real hot one. Um, I mean, are these going to be a couple of the main species you feel of that are always going to be gone after no matter what state you live in, or do you think this is a Southern problem where they're just saying these can live in the wild? Yeah, obviously right now it's a Southern problem. And unfortunately, you know, we got that mess in the Everglades with Burmese pythons. I mean, we can't argue about it. I mean, they're there. There's a lot of them. Um, not as much as some of the science, science in quotes says, you know, hundreds of thousands of them, but there's still a lot. I mean, they've caught, I forget the numbers, but I want to say over 20,000 Burmese pythons in the last, um, whatever, 30 years. So, I mean, it, they're catching a lot of animals down there and they, they shouldn't be there. So, and then you got that crazy USGS study for people who haven't been around for 15 years. So that's the United States Geological Survey did a study that said Burmese pythons could live in Southern Maryland. Um, I think you mentioned it earlier. You said the Ohio River, so about the same. But I mean, how crazy is that for people who know reptiles, for our federal government to tell us that Burmese pythons can live and breed and become invasive in Maryland? I mean, <laughs> and honestly, the, the bigger problem with that is what else is the government telling us that we don't realize is that bad? I mean, we get it because we're reptile people. We know how absurd that is. We know it absolutely cannot happen. We know if there are Burmese pythons living in Maryland, there are no people on the earth because uh, the ice caps have melted and everything's flooded and maybe Burmese pythons are floating around on islands, but people are going to be gone. But anyway, it's kind of scary on the larger level to think that the government can get away with calling that science. Um, well, I think everyone in the hobby, once you tell somebody not in the hobby what you do, everybody always brings up Burmese pythons. I'm sure you've heard that. Um, and, you know, talking about the study, I think it was on like Discovery Channel where they were talking about them being able to make it up to the Ohio River someday. Um, you know, people believe that. Um, you know, you watch it on the news, you watch it on Discovery Channel. You know, a Joe Schmo like me can't argue with somebody who watched something on Discovery Channel. Um, but that is definitely the biggest fear. Anybody I talk to that's not in the hobby is they bring up the Burmese python. And they use, the, I believe they use global warming for their own, for their point, right? I remember. If I yeah, remember. I mean, I even... I even heard it in Maine. So this was, I don't know, eight, nine years ago. I was actually in Maine <laughs> and their wildlife department said, we have to be concerned about Burmese pythons because of global warming. And again, <laughs> it goes back. If, if Burmese pythons are living in Maine, we're not going to be concerned with it because we're going to be long off the face of the earth, the human, human species. So it doesn't we'll, matter. We'd be underwater. <laughs> the Burmese I mean, the whole world would be here. <laughs> and yeah, I heard you mention something earlier, David, too. So I'm not going to speak on what former leadership with U.S. ARC never done. I know since I've been doing it for the last 12 years, U.S. ARC has never offered Burmese pythons up. Unfortunately, we have lost them in a couple states, but it's nothing where U.S. ARC has ever gone in and said, well, we'll let you ban Burmese pythons if you don't ban reticulated pythons. So we've, we've never done that intentionally. So we certainly haven't thrown them under the bus just to save something else. We always fight for you know, as was mentioned earlier, you know, responsible keepers. So no, everyone should not have a Burmese python as a pet. They should not be a starter snake species or pet species. But if you can responsibly keep them, you should be able to. Um, so do you feel, um, because, you know, like in Europe, there's a lot of different regulations that everybody follows by cage size based on animal. Um, do you feel like inevitably that's the direction the hobby in the United States will move into where it will be, Yes, there is regulation, but then there's still the freedom of doing what we're doing or giving up any rights at this point. Do you think that hurts us long term? 
I think it's definitely, it needs to be in the conversation. The problem with anything like that is you're always going to get people who don't follow our, our attempt to self-police. And, you know, that's, that's where the problem comes in. Just like we have, you know, certain reptile shows who aren't as good as other reptile shows. You know, we have people keeping big snakes and enclosures. They shouldn't be keeping big snakes and the same with venomous. And, and those are the ones that are always going to hit the media. You know, that's why the media talks about the Burmese Python. It's sensational. You know, you don't hear about, the thousands of big snake keepers and venomous keepers who are doing it right. You hear about the idiot in the driveway making TikTok videos with a spitting cobra in his parents' driveway, and then it gets loose. You know, that's that's the one you hear about. Um, and it's it's unfortunate, but one incident like that, and that that's how these bands pop up. And, you know, the animal rights side loves this stuff. And I don't, it's, it's kind of twofold on where these ban proposals come from and the bad legislation. So on one hand, you get someone as Elizabeth brought up earlier for uh, previous executive director, Eric Sutton down in Florida, he wanted to ban every non-native reptile in, in Florida. Um, so, and he was in a high position, so he made some of that happen. You know, that's one place you get it from where you get kind of a animal rights minded person as a head of a government agency. And the other side is just the animal rights groups who, if we have time, I can touch on that. But you know, groups like the Humane Society of the United States, they have $500 million in the bank right now, and they've published books saying that all reptiles should be banned as pets. And again, $500 million in the bank, that's more money than USR is going to bring in the next 500 years. And they have that much just sitting in the bank to, you know, use as the strings for puppets to get legislators to introduce the legislation that they write. So, in the last 12 years, I honestly don't know of a piece of legislation that was actually written by a legislator that we've worked on. It's always written by an animal rights type group and it's handed to a legislator and then the legislator introduces it. So even if the legislator is called the author of a bill, he or she or they are not who actually wrote the legislation. Um, <clears throat> so how does usr pick and choose their battles um and the reason i bring that up is you know we had that incident that made the news this past week with a um gila monster bite i believe in colorado um kid ended up passing away from it um, and i think within a couple of days i think cbs news had done a story about whether or not law should be changed about keeping that species um now is that something that no matter what the fight you guys are going for is that something that's on your radar or is that something that's just kind of in the early stages that really hasn't turned into anything yet. Yeah, so we have alerts through a couple different systems um, that pick up on this stuff. You know, that's how we're able to post our alerts and know about this stuff. Uh, usually, I, I mean, honestly, I think before anybody else ever gets it up, I'm the, or we're the group that we usually see putting it out there first, even finding stuff buried in 1800 page federal bills. But again, we're, we're constantly every day, we get alerts throughout the day on if something pops up. So um, it's, Again, if it pops up and becomes a serious issue, then we'll post an alert and let people know what's going on. But yeah, when it's just at the talked about stage, we don't have the resources to go and, and work on everything that's just in the talked about stage. You know, if it's something where we can, and sometimes we're asked to come in and work on issues in the development stage, then obviously we will, but um, it, we would need a lot more resources in order to go and do that, you know, kind of every time something pops up, unfortunately. I remember seeing an email on Washington State. Um, is there anything uh, that you wanted to talk about when it comes to the Pacific North Northwest? Yeah, so Washington, we stopped that bill the last two years. Um, it was it's a we call it an animal program ban. The animal rights groups who write it call it a circus ban, but they don't tell you what it actually does. So we get involved, and we're the only pet industry group that usually engages on these. Sometimes the AFA, American Federation of Aviculture, gets involved. They're they're great. They're kind of like us, so limited on resources. But it would have banned reptiles, any reptile, into a school and giving a talk about that, even if it was free. So you couldn't take a bearded dragon or a Greek tortoise, you know, even just small leopard geckos, corn snakes, anything like that. You couldn't take it in a car and take it somewhere and give any type type of presentation on it. But again, what legislators hear from the animal rights people are, oh, this is banning elephants and circuses and tigers jumping through flaming hoops. But <laughs> when you get into what the bill actually says, it goes a whole lot farther than that. And these, there's 
at least six different versions of this bill that floats around. Uh, sometimes it only includes lions, tigers, bears, elephants, uh, things like that. Sometimes it includes all non-native reptiles. We've seen it just include tortoises and monitors, varanids before. That was actually at the federal level a couple of years ago, as well as I believe Oregon and New Mexico. It was in three or four states or North Carolina was one of the states. So again, so, and here's an example of what I was talking about earlier. The exact same bill, the exact same language was proposed in Oregon, North Carolina, and at the federal level. So obviously anybody with a lick of common sense or critical thinking, even using 1% of <laughs> critical thinking ability, can tell you that three legislators did not sit down at the federal level on the East Coast and on the West Coast and write the exact same bill. Again, it was written by an animal rights group. Then it's fished around. They get these legislators to introduce it. And that's who actually writes the bills. And that's that's just a supreme example of the light bulb goes off in your head and you say, oh, wow, legislators really aren't writing this stuff. Hmm. Um, when you guys discover a thing like that where everybody's copy and paste into each other. Now, is that a does that benefit you guys at all? Or is it more like, hey, it's nice that you caught it, but it really doesn't matter? Well, yeah, it benefits us just in the fact that it streamlines our time it takes to get the alert up a little bit easier because the, the sample letter and everything's going to be about the same, but we still have to do all the other legwork for it. So you have to find out which committee it's going to. You have to get the email contacts for those committee members um, and you have to insert all that into the alert. So, you know, it, it, it streamlines the actual alert process by a few minutes, but we still have to go through the same process for, for wherever it is. Uh, and keep going nerdy with this. Um, there was something that was proposed in, I believe, Illinois within the last few years that I think there was even some chatter that maybe shows in the state might have been like outlawed. So that's the same. It's the animal program bill. As they're worded, they usually wouldn't apply to reptile shows because those are cells of reptiles and you're not really getting the animals out and doing any type of talk or anything with them. Um, New Mexico last year, I believe, was one where the way it was worded, it would have also banned reptile shows. But the way they're written, they usually shouldn't ban reptile shows. But there's certainly some concern there that, you know, a law enforcement officer may decide to look at it one way and decide to crack down on a reptile show. That could certainly happen. Okay. Um, when you guys are fighting, are you guys fighting like more in front of Congress? Is this something that's going even higher, like in front of the Senate? Where do you find yourself on these battles? Well, this is all over the place. I mean, we got local level bans. There was one last year in Nebraska, I believe it was. It was actually the worst ban we've seen because it banned all species not native to Iowa and Nebraska. And... Uh, again, think about that. That's that's almost everything you keep. And in addition to that, it banned snakes over six feet, I believe. So it was a small little city and it was important to stop it because it may have passed and gone someplace bigger. But yeah, we're doing this everything from, you know, cities with a thousand people to the state level to the federal level. Guys, so again, again, we just have these alerts. And when it comes up, whatever level it's at, we post the alert. Guys, did we bring up Arizona already or? Not yet. Okay. Yeah, Arizona's yes. another hot spot, right? Yeah, so we kind of took the lead on a bill in Arizona. It was, and this is another one that should just be scary to everybody. This is this is one that's not a reptile bill. This would have allowed for warrantless seizure of animals. And it literally said in the bill that your neighbor could have called on you, said they witnessed you abusing animals, and that could actually be used as testimony in court. I mean... Again, you could, you could have made somebody mad. You could have gotten into a fight with your ex or your significant other. Um, I mean, anything could have happened, and they actually could have used just someone saying they saw you do something as a reason to take your animals and without a warrant. So they could have just come and seized your animals. And then, again, all this stuff that we'll talk about tonight, we've got it broken down, the specifics on our website. But, I mean, if you're not familiar with what warrantless seizure means, I mean, you, <laughs> that, that should have been hugely concerning to everyone and not just in Arizona, because, again, sometimes we see these things pass and then it just catches like fire and spreads, just like the, the retail ban on the sales of dogs and cats. I think that's passed in over 100 cities now, and I think it's up to maybe six or seven states where pet shops can't sell dogs and cats. Um, some places it includes rabbits and ferrets. 
you know, you know, unfortunately it's probably a matter of time before they start throwing reptiles in there too. So, and I, I'm not, I'm not saying the sky is falling. I'm not being a Debbie downer. I'm just being realistic and telling you the trend of what we're seeing. And again, it's because, you know, you have a little group like us arc who's literally fighting, you know, 2 trillion with a T $2 trillion billion dollars or more or 2 trillion billion, $2 trillion or more that these animal rights groups are bringing in every year. I mean, it, it's ridiculous how well-funded these groups are. Again, uh, that's Go. everybody's worst nightmare. We all focus on fires and disease, you know, granted that's very important, right? But my God, I can't imagine anyone coming to my house and taking all my animals. And, and the, the important thing I don't think a lot of people realize, and actually I'll, I'll touch on Georgia, the Georgia example, but U.S. Arc puts out these alert, these alerts for a reason. So the main thing what U.S. Arc does is known as grassroots advocacy. And what that means is we get a whole lot of people sending in emails or making phone calls. And that's the foot in the door. That makes the legislators or the rule makers, if it's a, an agency doing it, want to talk to us. If people do not do that, the legislators are going to say nobody cares. So Georgia, for example... There was a show that claimed it got 16,000 people through the door. This was during the comment period on Georgia that banned black and white tegus and Burmese pythons. Again, the show claimed it got 16,000 people through the door. U.S. Arc had signage with QR codes where all you had to do was scan it and it took you straight to our alert. Literally takes less than a minute to send at least copy and paste and send that email if that's all you want to do. 16,000 people, this reptile show. There was about three months allowed for this comment period. And only about four dozen people in the whole state bothered to send an email. And what that tells the commissioners is, again, nobody cares. There was more people who wrote in supporting it than reptile people did to oppose it. And again, that's the foot in the door because every state or city or federal level is going to have a certain threshold that you have to meet. So, you know, if that number instead of 48 people would have been 500 people, then the commissioners would have said, well, a whole lot of people care about this. We need to talk to this U.S. art group and see what they have to say about it. But when that when we don't even get the foot in the door from our grassroots advocacy, that it makes it way, way harder to to stop or reverse those things. Right. Uh, well, like I said, there's the truth there. And, you know, I'm in the same boat. I don't always read this stuff. Um, you know, sometimes it's just having a conversation with somebody else to get me up to speed. But um like I said, it's not that there's a laziness in the hobby, but you know, there's a little bit of a laziness sometimes, and I don't think we always take it serious. Yeah, and it's it's really important. So I'm actually going to give you an out, David, <laughs> because what's most important is you want people in that city or state to actually be the ones doing it. Because if we get 90% of the people who are doing that stuff are from outside the state, you know, that can actually be negative. Um, so that's why we always ask that you include at least your zip code. If you don't want to put your city and state, you know, at least ex include your zip code so that the lawmakers and decision makers can see it's actual people from within the state who are uh, opposing or supporting whatever's going on. Okay. Um, now, of course, you know, I know how busy you guys are and I know there's always people looking to help out in any way they can. Um, now, is this something where they're like, you know, the state of Georgia, an example, would have a team of guys all vendors that would just have something behind their table that they could hand out something that could be signed and filled out on the spot. Like, you know, what can people do if they want to help out more when their state is in need? Yeah. So we had that a little bit in Georgia, but again, I mean, I'm not putting all the fault on, on them or Georgia residents by any means. U.S. Arc should have thrown more at it too, but you know, we had all that stuff down there, Frank Bird and Bob Vu. I know, you know, those guys, you know, they had all the stuff at their table. Um, again, there was, I mean, it was literally, there was thousands of pieces of literature there as well as the banners and, and stuff for people to look at. And again, it's as simple as it could be with QR codes. So, um, you know, certainly people can, can ask for help. And obviously the more people talking about it, the better. So, you know, at the Herp show this weekend, for example, we'll have, you know, four or five banners with the QR code that are spread throughout the show. There'll be a U.S. ARC booth where we're not doing fundraising. We're not there to raise money for U.S. ARC. There's no auction. This is specifically to help fight this Louisiana regulation. And, you know, we're going to be focused on that. So anybody who wants to show up this weekend and help, obviously that would be appreciated because if we got um, just me and maybe a couple volunteers doing it, um, we're going to be limited on how many signatures we can get. If we got 10 people helping me out, then obviously we're going to collect way more signatures. And, and 
let me let me say real quick uh, that Louisiana uh, impending legislation uh, looks a lot like Florida. It, it smells like Florida. I mean, man, that's a lot of 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 bands, potential bands. Is that you when that's what they're like five species, correct? Is what you said? On the prohibited list, yeah. There's again, we've got it broken down. It's actually a few more species that I didn't name, um, but That's it's good. broken down there. And then there's regulation changes on top of it, so it's not going to ban as many species common in trade as as Florida did, but it's still going to be a few. I mean, green iguanas and savannah monitors and Burmese yeah, pythons. Yeah. Um. So, what's the goal for signatures this weekend? Like, what's your bar? Well, I, I haven't been to this show, so I don't know how many people come to this show. Um, I mean, if it's if it's 3,000 people through the door, you know, we would hope to get at least maybe 750 signatures. Um, you know, if it's more like 5,000 people through the door, hopefully we break 1,000. But, you know, it all just kind of depends on how many people get through the door. And, and some people, you know, some people are afraid to do it. The only information we ask for is your name and zip code on the petition. That's all it is. It's a printed name. It's a sign name and it's a zip code. And I haven't once in 12 years ever seen anybody targeted who either signed on as a plaintiff in a lawsuit or spoke out against these things. You know, I hear that excuse a lot. Oh, I don't want anybody knowing what I have. And, you know, that's fine. I'm not going to tell you, you know, that's your freedom, freedom to do that. But I have never seen anybody targeted by taking action with a U.S. ARC alert. Okay. Um, so what are some important dates coming up with this um, everything in Louisiana? Yeah, so March 6th. So people, if you're in Louisiana, just again, go to usarc.org. The alert is the fourth one down, I think, maybe fifth one down. Just scroll down a little bit. It says Louisiana Herp Regulation Overhaul right there. Just click on it. And just uh, again, it's literally a minute. You can obviously take more time than that and edit the sample letter, which is great for the people that do that. But I mean, how long does it take to copy paste? If you don't know how to do that, Google it. Um, I've actually had people who said they're actually typing out, retyping the US ARC alert, but there is a really simple way. It takes a few seconds to copy and paste something. Um, if you don't know how to do it on your device, again, Google it and learn, but it takes less than a minute to copy, paste, and send off that email. So the more people that do that, the better chances we're going to have. And it's March 6th, again, is the deadline, which is next Wednesday. Yep. Yeah, so this is going to be the last chance before this. Yep. All right. um, what happens after that? Is that the do or die day? Or, I mean, no. So March 6th is the end of the comment period. Then I don't know exactly what the time frame will be, but it could be two, three, four months after that. They'll probably staff will present to the commissioners, you know, what the, how many people opposed it, how many people supported it, you know, what specifics were that people were opposing. Ideally, what we're pushing for is to get a workshop with, you know, preferably myself, uh, some Louisiana stakeholders, maybe some rehabbers, because I know they have some issues with it too, but, you know, just kind of get a round table setting where we can go through it line by line and say, you know, why, why are you putting this in there? And, you know, what's your science to support this, things like that. So, you know, if we get that workshop, you know, it could be six, seven, eight months before the commissioners actually hear about this. So, you know, there's no set time frame. We don't know exactly when it's going to go up for a vote, but probably most likely sometime within the next six months. Okay. Um, so, you know, we have what just happened in Georgia. We have what you're working on in Louisiana. Um, we had something in Alabama a couple of years ago too with the big constrictors. Did that go through? Yeah, that did go through. And we actually had a lawsuit in Alabama. And unfortunately, all, all the plaintiffs that were really affected dropped out <laughs> during the course of the lawsuit. So the court finally said, you know, you're not able to demonstrate harm. And it, it just got dismissed a couple of weeks ago. But, you know, we again, we we threw it at it, but no, it was hard to get people to sign on as plaintiffs. And then, you know, the lawsuit drug on for a little over two years and the plaintiffs just dropped off one by one, said, I don't want to be involved anymore. So unfortunately, we didn't prevail on on getting that reversed. Okay. No, and that's, I mean, can we ever, is that could ever be back on the table or was that the moment and it's over now? Oh, I mean, yeah, it could certainly, I mean, in five years, you know, if you get new people in that department, it could certainly be looked at and reviewed, but we would have to get, that's a question I get pretty common actually on working on repealing or amending a current law, but you really need a core group of people 
in that state who really want to work on it. I don't, I'm, I'm going to guess 40 times at least I've had people contact me about something, a state regulation that's currently in place. And I've typed out, you know, detailed what they need to do, which isn't that much. You know, the first step is just getting a group of like-minded people who are willing to work on this. I've never had anybody follow up with the, <laughs> with the email. Um, you know, unfortunately, I think a lot of people think that U.S. ARC just has hundred million dollars every year to play with. And we just send teams of lawyers in to work on all this stuff. And that's just, that's not the reality. Um, you know, I think sometimes on the outside, looking in the community, you know, we see these big successes of, you know, good auctions at Tinley, you know, good auctions at the um, California shows down in Daytona. Um, you know, we get really excited about that kind of stuff. But like you said, it's these in between months, of the shows, these different regulations, these, signatures that you're needed i mean that's kind of what's always been neglected when it came to us arc um i think we even made a comment a few years ago when we were talking memberships um just how low they are surprisingly um so yeah and a couple things one people don't realize how much i mean a lawsuit cost i mean us arc florida alone spent a million dollars just in attorney fees in two years i mean a million dollars and that was just attorney fees again none of their board is paid the board actually the first year funded probably 75% of US Arc Florida. So it was actually the board of directors who was funding that organization to get it off the ground. But it, it's just crazy what, I mean, attorneys are six, seven, eight hundred dollars $800. I remember during our federal lawsuit, we had an attorney who was billing us at $915 an hour. Luckily he was a partner and he wasn't doing the bulk of the work, but still, you know, a few hours here and there at $915 an hour, your money goes real quick. And, you know, people talk about suing and filing lawsuits, but those are people who have never filed lawsuits or had to pay for an attorney. Uh, another one I, I saw somewhere was people talked about how attorneys won't take something unless they think they can win it. And that's because their experience with attorneys is watching television commercials where you're in a car accident and then an attorney will take it for whatever, 40% of whatever you make of it. But that's not how most attorneys work. Attorneys want to get paid and they want to take they want to take the work. So even if they don't think there's a great chance of winning, they're more than happy to collect your money and, and file a lawsuit. And then, Phil, real quick for the audience out there, what exactly passed in, um, in Alabama? What was it that passed that got banned? It was all take a ban on all tegus, Nile monitors, and the large constrictor snakes. Wow. So, um, awesome. And we're talking. So I know we're talking a little bit about our losses. So I've been yeah. doing this twelve years, I think. I would have to sit down and run the numbers, but we've stopped over ninety five percent of the stuff we've got engaged in, which is just unreal. What baseball team wins ninety five percent of games, or professional sports teams? I mean, when you get into those kind of numbers, you know, it's kind of like. Yelp reviews, you know, someone can go to a restaurant for 20 years, have great service every time. The one time they get bad service, they go and put a one star review. You know, no, no, I, absolutely. Feel that's kind that. of what we get sometimes. People want to talk about, oh man, US Arc lost this. They don't talk about, I mean, just this year we've stopped three state bills already. Um, a but absolutely, but that's I, not what I, you hear about. Absolutely. But the reason I bring it up is for the audience out there to understand why it's so important to have. Uh, U.S. ARC membership in both Florida and nationally and to take care of, you know, the people that take care of us. No, absolutely. That wasn't going after you. I just wanted to point that out. A lot of yeah. times people only say, you know, U.S. ARC sucks. They lost this. And that's their yeah. opinion. They can have that. I'm not going to tell them they're wrong if that's what they want to believe. But again, the, the success rate, especially for an organization this small. So in our federal lawsuit, we filed that my first year as president. We brought in $340,000 my first year. We had our little $340,000 organization, which by the way, was in the red and was a sunken ship when I came along, unfortunately. But anyway, we owed everybody money. We got all that taken care of, but $340,000. And not only was that lawsuit against the federal government, United States Fish and Wildlife Service, but the Humane Society of the United States, which I already brought up, brings in $200 million a year and has half a billion dollars in the bank. They were on there as a defendant and also Center for Biological Diversity, which also has tens of millions of dollars. So we had our little group who doesn't even bring in as much money as the postage for CBD or HSUS. And we were able to beat all three of those groups just because we were on the, the right side of it. Unfortunately, we were able to fund it. And a huge shout out to someone you don't hear about very often, but Jordan Russell and Mike Clarkson, those guys were huge in helping us keep funded the first three or four years. So 
thanks for those guys in Raqqa. For anybody who remembers Raqqa, the Reptile and Amphibian Charity Auctions. No, that's awesome. Um, yeah, I definitely don't think everything you guys are doing is a loss. I mean, I focus on the losses right now because it's, you know, people need to know. Um, but the reality is the hobby is still standing because of you guys. So we know you guys are definitely winning a lot for us. Real quick, um, Phil, the Lacey Act is always around as well, right? That's another one. That yes. we always got to watch. So, again, it was our group who found that. So the one when it got most awareness was when it was in the Competes Act, which was an 1,800-page bill. And I'm not getting that number wrong. I think it was 1,815 pages. And this was two pages that were buried at the end of that bill, the Competes Act. It was supposed to be about competing with China on electronics and technology. And these Lacey Act amendments got slipped in there. Um, but we, we found it and put out alerts. And actually, I, I did lie about that number. I think it was 28. 115 pages when it passed the uh, when it passed the house it was 3600 because it had amendments added to it um but again it was just a crazy amount of pages but you know because that's what we do we were able to find it and put out an alert about it and but then so it it didn't pass that session it came back this session from senator rubio from florida and also representative luna both from florida which again it's a florida issue um florida has already addressed it passed a whole bunch of bans it, it doesn't affect the rest of the country so it, it it should stay uh you know florida and maybe one or two states in the south issue this isn't something that affects the other 47 states it's always marco and i i, I always call his office and i get his staff on the phone i mean i, I do my part awesome thank I you i would tell i would tell everyone out there when all this is going down make sure you have your you know your membership all year and you also do your part you know these people represent you. You can call them. Yeah, quickly. One we didn't talk about yet, a new one <laughs> and something, another scary one. If you didn't see the Colorado alert, that one was alarming. It was a pet tax that could have taxed up to $8.50 on every pet that you have. And it applied to reptiles, birds, and vertebrates, as well as dogs and cats. So think about that. And fish. So if you had a fish tank or koi in a pond out in the back of your yard. I mean, a lot of people own a hundred fish. This literally could have taxed you $850 a year just to keep those hundred fish annually. So you would have to pay that every year. And then if you didn't designate someone to take the animals in case of an emergency, like if you died in a plane crash, if you didn't designate someone to keep those animals, I believe it was either $22.50 or $25 per animal. I mean, imagine how quickly that adds up. I mean, how many people do you know that own at least 10 reptiles? I mean, are they going to want to pay an additional eighty-five to two hundred fifty dollars a year just to keep those those ten reptiles? It was it was crazy, but luckily it it got nipped in the bud and didn't go anywhere. But we'll see if it comes back. But that was something we hadn't seen before, and imagine that passing all over the place. We'd have a lot less pets. Oh, for sure. Um, so um, you know, with culture change, I feel like the culture and politics have changed. You know, you've been at this for a long time. I mean, when you're out there seeing these people, does the vibe always been about the same or do things feel a little bit different now when you're doing these fights? They, they don't feel that much different. Occasionally you see something. What we're, what I'm starting to see is some legislators are picking up on what animal rights groups are really about. Whereas we didn't see that as much just even two or three years ago. Um, they're really starting to realize what that agenda is. And that agenda is no animals in our lives. That means, you know, no cows for milk, no chickens for eggs. It means no pets, including dogs and cats. You know, that's the end agenda is they do not want any benefit to humans from animals. And that that's their end game. And they're poking around at it and they just have so much money. And they they spend hundreds of millions of dollars every year on lobbying and you know how do you how do you compete with that so at the state level there could be 15 to 50 depending on the state full-time lobbyists from these different groups who are just in there every day talking to legislators and trying to get them to introduce and pass this stuff i mean it's it's alarming and you know on top of you know looking at what us arc is people need to realize what the animal rights agenda is and and realize what that means it's for someone who knows what it is, um, you know, you just laugh when you hear someone with a pet say, I'm an animal rights activist, because you can't do that. If you have a pet, 
you cannot be an animal rights activist because you don't believe in pets at the core of animal rights. That's, that's what it is. So people need to realize the difference between animal welfare and animal rights and stop supporting groups like HSUS, even the ASPCA. PETA obviously is a big one. A lot of people know who PETA, what PETA is all about, but they don't realize all the other groups who are doing the exact same thing. It's just a difference between being radical and having naked women in Times Square with blood on them. That's what PETA does. But then you have the other groups who are wearing suits and getting paid hundreds of millions of dollars to go and, and lobby. Now, if they're just simply wanting to control life, I mean, what's the benefit of some of these laws they're trying to pass in your eyes? Like, is it just somebody else that money gets passed to that they know that run a certain department? Like, is there actually true environmental issues that they're worried about? Like, you know, what's the motivation here? I mean, at the end of it, it's like a religion. I mean, that is literally like a religion to these people. They just believe that, you know, cows should not be fenced in and people shouldn't be riding horses and we shouldn't be eating eating eggs from chickens. And it's not about a choice. They want to make it. So that's how it is. So it's not that you should have a choice to be vegetarian or vegan. It's that that is the norm. And that's what everybody has to abide by because all animals have been removed from our lives. And it's literally, I mean, it's like a, it's like a cult religion. Scary stuff to say the least. Right. Yeah, it is because there's no, so sometimes legislators, you know, you can you can get it and you can get them swayed, but you can't talk to these people. I mean, they have their mindset. You know, it's like a Democrat arguing with a Republican. I mean, it's <laughs> there's just nothing's going to nothing's going to change their mind or arguing about if Michael Jordan or LeBron James is the best basketball player. You know, it's, yeah. some people it, it's just, you're wasting your breath by yeah. arguing, arguing with these people. So cool. anyone in the chat and, uh, you know, myself, uh, Dave. MJ, we need to get some uh, some people in Louisiana to help fill out. You know, we need to get some uh, some people to volunteer to go out there. What do you think? Of, you know, anyone in the chat? You got friends in Louisiana? Let's make it happen. Yeah, just show up. Show up this weekend in Gonzales. So I'm not sure what the website is, but if you type in Herps Reptile Show, H E R P S, it's Sean Gray's show. Um, it'll come up. It's this weekend in Gonzales. Yeah, I've heard great things about that uh, show, so it's probably should be a good turnout. I hope show is always good. Um, well, Gus, um, how's the ride been for you, man? You keeping your sanity for us? I don't. I don't have time to not be insane. I guess. <laughs> so, but yeah, I mean, we're. I think US Arc's finally at the point where we're going to start growing a little bit and get some more staff, and you know do do an even better job for the herp community so hopefully that that starts going here uh, there's a couple people that i'm talking to that hopefully we'll be able to bring in the next six to nine months max and we'll, we'll see what happens we do have some more people helping us out that we couldn't even afford part-timers before but um so there is at least more than me poking around and back back when i started uh, rick stanley if anybody remembers him uh, he was huge. We overturned. I mean, that was scary too. West Virginia, West Virginia had a dangerous wild animals act that banned everything non-native to West Virginia. So it would have banned all pythons, leopard geckos, all tropical fish. I mean, guinea pigs, hamsters, it would have banned everything non-native to the state. And it was Rick and myself working on that. And we got that stopped. Um, so yeah, this, this stuff's been going on for a while. You guys usually win these fights with science or everyone's going to be a little different. Yeah, it, it's everyone's a little bit unique, um, and but all, but every time, I mean, the the driving force again, the foot in the door is just people. Even if you think it's it's pointless, you're like, oh, someone else is going to do it. I don't have to take thirty seconds to send an email. Those every one of those emails adds up, and you never know exactly what that magic number is. But you know, if it's a state level, that magic number may be a thousand. Um, if it's a local level, it may only be two or three dozen. But you have to have that many local people who send an email or, and or make a phone call. And that's that's the foot in the door. Well, it's, it's not only that, uh, that email or, you know, these re these representatives are afraid. Right. Because now everyone has social media. Everyone can amplify their message. So the every single person that fights with us is going to make an impact because they have a social media. They have let's say hundreds of followers and you know, all that adds up, man. So do your part. Absolutely. 
so not to get into this too much, um, but, you know, there was the incident that um, came up in Florida where when they were euthanizing those animals, um, a boa constrictor was euthanized on accident. Um, you know, what from that situation has benefited us in any way in the hobby? Like, I know a lot of people thought like that was like a win because a mistake was made, but, you know, what came out of that in your eyes? So, yeah, that was huge. Obviously, unfortunate, you know, it happened to John McAdams boa. Um, and Chris Coffey was the one whose his reticulated pythons were the one that was killed. Big Sherl was the name of the boa who was gravid um, with healthy babies because they did a necropsy and found those healthy babies in there. But I th what was huge about that was U.S. Arc Florida, you know, putting out the videos and constantly putting out information. And U.S. Arc Florida, you know, didn't attack um, – you know, obviously you can't control what everyone does on social media, but, you know, it was U.S. Arc and others constantly updating on the situation to make people aware of it. Because if that hadn't happened, we wouldn't know about it. And FWC wouldn't have had to look at it and FWC wouldn't have had to change their policies. And it may happen again the next week. Um, but again, it was because of that awareness that was spread that, you know, it warranted change. Okay. okay. Um Man, I know I had a couple more things I want to go over. Um, so this is, okay, here's something I wanted to ask. Um, I hope this isn't like an overstep, but it's more of a question about operations. Um, you know, me and Ryan McVeigh had an awesome conversation on here about a year ago. And, you know, one big thing we were talking about was like fundraising, you know, people out there, um, you know, raising money for US Arc. Um, you know, a lot of these nonprofits have a guy out there, boots on the ground, taking people out to lunch, so on and so forth. And I know you guys are doing the same thing, but... Um, are companies like PetSmart, Petco, or any of these bigger pet providers doing anything to help us out? Um, because, you know, they do make a lot of money off of our hobby in a sense. Do we get anything from them? Or is that something that maybe we could start pursuing just to be a bigger force? Yeah, so really it kind of bumped up a lot when US Arc was, we started getting all the action because of, we found those Lacey Act amendments buried in the Competes Act. So whatever, three years ago, I believe it was now, but that's when a lot of the bigger companies and pet trade organizations started paying attention to us. So we are getting some additional funding. We were always getting a little bit from, you know, some companies and trade organizations like that, but it definitely amped up a little bit in the last three years. So um, that's one of the things that will help us sustain so we can, you know, add staff and, and get bigger and do more. Okay. And you know, I know there's a lot of people that volunteer their time for free, of course, Um you think that'd be a position in the hobby that'd be frowned upon if we had somebody out there that was truly like um, my, my dad's um, ex-wife was with the boys and girls club and she had to raise X amount of dollars every quarter, every year. And that affected her salary. It affected her bonuses, but you know, she hit her goals and of course they wanted her to get paid for it. Do you think if we had somebody in the industry that was, that was their job, do you think it'd be frowned upon because they were making money off of it? So two things. Do I think it would be frowned upon by some? Yes, but those are the people that are never going to donate to US Arc anyway. And I mean, I even sometimes I get random emails. People want to know why I get paid. And I guess they think I should just be spending half the year in a hotel and not having a life and doing all this and not get paid for it. But um, it's crazy what you see, you know, people, people think. And a lot of people don't understand what a nonprofit organization actually means. It doesn't mean that they can't have employees and can't get paid. It just means you can't do things like I can't go out and, you know, buy a new car and, you know, bill it to us arc or buy a house for myself or something like that. It just, all the money has to go towards whatever your state admission is. Um, so, but again, when you're a group like us arc, you have to have, basically I'm a lobbyist. Um, so, I mean, I'm, I'm getting paid for that. And then if we, if the board did decide to do, you know, a position like what you're talking about, David, then, I'm sure some people would be like, wow, that's where my money's going. But, you know, if they're bringing in more money than what they're getting paid, then they're actually benefiting U.S. ARC. So I'm not going to say it's out of the question, but it's not something we're looking at currently. Understandable. Um, well, but I mean, you gave us 45 minutes and of course I'd like longer, but, you know, I know you got a busy weekend ahead of you. Um, anything else you want to throw in at the end here? Um, and Emilio, anything you got, bud? Well, we got one super chat question. Um I mean, that might be an easy answer. Are there any states in particular that stand out as more reptile friendly than others? 
Yeah, I always hate to say that because if I did, then <laughs> next year we're going to see something proposed at, at the state level. Um, obviously, usually, you know, typically the colder states just because they don't have a scientific argument. So any any place that has what we'll call a bad winter, a cold winter, whatever you want to call it, you know, they're not going to have an argument for subtropical and tropical species of reptiles ever becoming invasive. So, you know, those are the states where you're probably going to be the, the safest, if we want to say that. Um, but then a lot of it depends on what species you keep, too. You know, if you're keeping big snakes and you get someone who lets 10 of them go or um, has has a big escape, um, then who knows? You know, it could it could come up anywhere. So that's why I know you guys mentioned it earlier in the in the podcast, but. U.S. Arc always talks about responsible keepers. So that's who we're out fighting for. And if someone's not doing it right, uh, I'm sorry, but we're not going to stick our necks out for you and, and come to fight for you. You know, we'll we'll come try and protect everybody else if there's one idiot out there. But, you know, if you're if you have more animals than you can take care of properly or if you're keeping, you know, giant snakes and tiny enclosures, you know, that's that's not being responsible. 100 percent. Um, so yeah, I don't, again, that's, that's the best answer I want to give you on the spot is again, typically the, the states that have at least a freezing winter, um, even just a day or two, those are the states where you're going to be the safest, at least on the invasive species argument. And then obviously Texas is Texas. I mean, Texas, it, it needs to become a Republic again and, and get out of the federal government. Um, but you know, Texas, like they like to protect their freedoms, but then unfortunately in Texas now we have all kinds of stuff happening at the city level, you know, just, Dallas, that was a surprise for me. Right. Well, that's an old law too. That predates us arc. So that's not anything that, you know, happened that we could have stopped. That was, you know, an old ordinance that predates us arc. So um, there's a lot of that around. There's a lot of ordinances from the sixties and seventies that, that actually ban all non-native reptiles or non-native animals as exotics, but, people don't know about it and then doesn't get enforced you know and for you see it sometimes again like i brought up earlier if there's a domestic dispute or you make a neighbor mad and you get reported um then obviously law enforcement's going to have to do something if they show up at your house and all exotic or non-native animals are banned but other than that it's not like they go knocking on doors and looking for this stuff okay uh well, I know you're worried about this being a little boring, buddy, but I'll be honest, I love these conversations. Um, and honestly, I think this is truly the best way to inform people on what's going on in the hobby. Um, you know, I know we don't always have time for this kind of stuff. You know, it gets busy. I know you're a busy man, but, you know, I know a lot of people always want to hear about this. You know, I always want to hear about this kind of stuff. Um, you know, I hope you want to do this with us again, because honestly, um, I think this is the best way of passing on information in the hobby nowadays. Yeah, I absolutely can. I mean, videos taken over, you know, I'm, you know, I like, I like sitting down and reading things. Um, so, you know, obviously we make it as digestible as possible in the alerts, but especially on like that Louisiana regulation, it's still a lot to take in, even though we broke it down as simple as we could and just touched on the highlights. But, you know, everyone listening probably knows as well as I do. I mean, YouTube and TikTok and Instagram videos, you know, that's, that's what's taken over. That's a new format. So obviously you may not it's a little bit harder to get a big audience than if we just have it posted on a website and accessible, but it's certainly a huge, huge part of it. So yeah, if we could do this again, um, I'll try and make myself available. Right, but Hey man, you're right. Social media is everything. You know, if you want to start a little YouTube channel, light a candle, get some tea and just sit down and read us the bills, buddy. I'll go to sleep <laughs> listening to that every night. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what's going to happen. Everybody's going to go to sleep. Well, you know, when you're done, I mean, not not in the middle. Yeah. But I'll start it back up in the morning every time, I promise. I'll be like Fraser Crane voice. I'd uh, ever go to sleep after about a minute. <laughs> Man, we, we, truly, we truly appreciate everything you guys do. And we need to do more for you guys. And we will be pushing that fo going forward. We have to. I appreciate it. Appreciate your time tonight, fellas. No, appreciate yours. Um, thank you again, Phil, honestly. And like I said, I'm looking forward to doing this again with you. All right, cool. Thanks, everybody who watched tonight and everybody who's super chatting. Good luck in the raffles. Be interesting to see how that goes. I hope people ponied up because you got, I mean, you got to have like six or $7,000 worth of stuff. <laughs> uh, that's a lot of stuff. And uh, again, it was more than we asked for. Um, you know, I appreciate everybody who um, donated anything, but um, no, there's going to be some cool prizes given out right now. And 
you know, next time we'll prepare for this better. We'll advertise for it better. And, you know, we'll get more for you guys. Well, cool. Appreciate it. Thanks again, fellas. <laughs> Thank you, bud. Thank you, man. Have a good night. Let's All say right. we're streaming yet. <laughs> All right. So we're working on the raffle right now. Okay, tight. I, I, I stopped writing tickets at 80. I don't know if we had under 50, over 50 super chats that came in. Um, I got the old alligator hat ready. I'm going to fill it up with these little stick of notes with numbers on it. So you just let me know when it's time. He's doing it. Yeah, I trust you. I trust you both. But, um, well, I thought that was fun, man. Did you enjoy yourself? Oh, yeah. I learned a ton, man. I'll tell you that. I learned a ton. Yeah, no, I, uh, I I mean, I was versed. I read some of the alerts, obviously, most of the alerts. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to sit here and tell you I re read everything fully, right? But I see, I know what's happening. That's why I was able to bring something to the national conversation. Um, and I'm going to continue to just read more. We need to, we need to know what's happening. Yeah, um, I do agree with the read more. Um, I will challenge myself, but you know, again, I really mean it. And you know, I hope they still continue to make time for us. But um, you know, a lot of people just want to sit down and listen. Um, I guarantee you, ninety percent of the things that we talked about or more today, most people in the industry weren't even aware of. Um, these are kind of the nerdier things to talk about. Um, but I don't know. I enjoy everything about this hobby, the good, the bad. Um, so I always want to hear about it. I wasn't aware of. Uh, the losses in Alabama. I'll tell you that. Yeah, um, you know, losses are tough. Um, you know, we're always going to have some, but in the bigger picture of things, like Phil said, um, you know, there's so many wins that we have. It's not always worth focusing on the losses, but there's an understanding out there that we can lose. Yes, yeah, and that's why it was important for them to, you know, for the audience to know that today. No, for sure. Um, so, if you don't mind me asking, how many do we have in the lives today? Um, I believe I saw up to 120, but I could okay. be wrong. Respect. Okay. Well, I think, um, Ben with RGI and Justin got better numbers. So I'm, I'm a little, you know, I thought we'd be a little bit more. I'll be honest guys, but you know, I'm happy we got this 120 out here, man. Much respect here. You're, you're going to clean up the odds are in everybody's favor to win something cool now because nobody showed up. Well, I'll tell you this. We, we, we got, uh, us arc and us arc Florida, a ton of money. So, I mean, cool. Well, um, so we know about how many numbers I should put in here. I'm up to about 20 in the hat right now. I'm just going to keep going until you tell me to stop. Uh, Over 50? Where are you at? I don't have numbers. I have the names written down. Okay, you have all the names. I'm putting them in a hat. She's putting them in a hat right now. Oh, she's doing the hat or am I doing the hat, guys? Who's in charge of the hat right now? <laughs> my wife's doing the hat. Okay, I'm just going to put my hat to the side then. I'm, I'm done with this hat. hat. Yeah, that, that, that's okay. How much money do you have? Almost or close to 2000 We're I, close to $2,000. I, I, I had to stop okay. adding so I could start doing this. Yeah, she had to stop adding. You know, and that's still fair. Coming there, Much still respect. Got super chats coming in. So. All right. Yeah, keep them flowing, guys. Let's um, you know, <laughs> get the last ones in. It's like okay. We've got, we've got yeah. overtime. <laughs> All right. And uh, so, how do we want to do this? Because. You know, some of these prizes, you know, are meant for some people and not other people. I mean, I don't want to give, do we just pick the names and then we contact them afterwards and let them Royal Rumble who gets what? Like, how should we do this? I think we should, we should, we should name every prize on the live and we should, I'll let you select each, you know, order the prizes and that's how we'll, you know, I guess we'll select it, right? Is that the right okay. way? Yeah, or um, I think, what did we have? Was it seven donations, I believe? We said we have Chris with Sea Serpents, um, Darian with Dubia Roaches, Adeline and Chris. Um, we have... Um, Canova. Canova. We have... Come on, keep going, man. I'm retarded. Myself. Okay. We have me. Um, you, um, MJ, uh, Monday Night Podcast yeah, spot for somebody MJ, to come sit in. We have uh, uh, the T Exotics. The Exotics. Uh, hardwired. Okay. So I don't know if this is the wrong way of doing this, but do we do one through eight, pick names, let the winners know, they contact us. We started at the first person and let them pick the item they want until we get to the bottom of the list. Then at least yeah, they have I, some I think control. The first person should pick the item they want, right? Okay. Okay. Can we get them like as soon as we got that person? Are we able to communicate with them? Is the technology there? 
I think that I think everyone's in chat, brother, waiting. Okay, cool. Then we're gonna do this. We'll go and we'll do this till it's over. I'm ready. Yeah. Are we ready though? <laughs> we're almost ready, and we're still getting super chats. Right. Okay, keep them rolling. Keep them rolling. <laughs> I, we we can pause. You know, there's no rush here. Do we have anything in the questions that maybe we want to address? Any anything that came in? So we can keep this rolling while we yeah. wait. Please. I can hear panic in the background. Is it really still <laughs> yeah, go to my story on IG. You'll see it. Uh, you could also see it on uh, Dave's Facebook. Yep. Everything's in the comments on my Facebook page on the post if you want to see the items that are up. And next time we'll do a better um, we'll do better at showing everybody what's out there. All right, uh, More Valley Reptiles is asking, where is Dave Levinson going to vend next? Oh, um, Gatson, Alabama this weekend. Um, this is my last little show for a few weeks. Uh, I'm going to take a weekend off. You'll see me walking around Tinley. And then I got to check. I'm back on the road. I might go to Oklahoma City at the end of the month. Um, I haven't really decided my schedule. Um, I'll be honest. My schedule this time of the year really depends on the herpy. Um, you know, I'm going to plan some trips around some early season herpy this time of the year. Um, anybody in a city that you know I'm coming to, if you want to put me on your secret spots, let me know. Um, I won't tell anybody about it. And but, by the um, way, where, where are you driving from exactly? Um, I'm in Missouri. You're in Missouri. I'm, I'm like, yeah, I'm like, out, I'm like south, southeast Missouri. Yeah, you okay. wouldn't even know where by, I live. By, by the way, TriStar Morphs. Jason thinks you have a sexy beard. I appreciate it. It's really coming along. Um, it's one I'm of my hoping, best I'm hoping, I'm hoping he's not talking about me. Uh, uh, you got the real beard here, so. Yeah, that is true. And by the way, I think I just, hold on one second. I'm going to touch my phone a little bit while you guys get this going. I had something come in. I got to read. But um, like, get some more questions going, man. Let, let's burn some time while we knock this out. Oh, no, hey, no, you're Brock, fine. Brock wants to talk about pastel. Oh, okay. Let's talk about pastel, buddy. Um, you know, where, where where do you want to start? You want to start about um, the initial pastels that came in, the lemons with um, <laughs> Kevin McCurley? Um, oh, you want man. to talk about the Graziani line? Yeah, Brock. Um, Brock uh, me and Brock started like uh, we started a fire, you know? Oh, fire. Well, I, I, I really, I'll be honest. <laughs> I love the pastel conversation because, you know, it really was like that early foundation mutation. Um, you know, everybody saw the bumblebees early on and fell in love with it. Um, you know, I definitely agree. There are some projects I want to keep that out of it. That's the discussion we're having right now. But, you know, let me, me being a big... Quick. Let me stop Go. Real quick. I still fucking love a bumble bumblebee. And I don't care what anybody says. It. Brock, I don't care. All right? I don't yeah. care. I love bumblebees and people love bumblebees. It's a, it's just an iconic looking animal. People like that black and yellow. I mean, you know, hate the fact that every once in a while these guys aren't perfect. I'll be honest. I don't produce as many spiders as we used to, but I'm not making spiders like I was in the mid 2000s. Uh, uh, hey, but, I'm not either, but guess what? I ain't making Powerballs either. Shots fired. Well, I made a Powerball a couple of years ago and sold it to Chad and it's good. You know, it's good, man. Okay. I'm, I'm but, sorry. <laughs> right. Dave, no disrespect, but I mean, that's what a lot of us say about our spiders too. Just saying. Yeah, no, that's Let's cool, man. With this shit. Yeah. Well, I, I'll just go ahead and say that I'm um, spot nose is probably way more important than with spiders in the hobby, but at the same time, one of the best things I've ever made had a spider in it. So I'm just living in that life. Yeah. I love, I love, I absolutely love spot nose. So I ain't talking shit at all. No, for sure, man. And, you know, I um, you know, I was talking ball pythons this past week. Go figure. And, you know, you kind of look at the old school way of pairing and like, you know, lessers. And we talked about the spinner stuff, and the calico stuff. And, you know, you're looking at stuff that like Justin's doing and other people are doing right now. This whole conversation started because of the redhead gene. No disrespect. Roll the ball pythons has a picture of a redhead on there as the single gene. I've been looking at that for years, assuming that was the single gene. I had no idea how subtle the redhead gene was until I actually started looking at it everywhere else. Much respect for picking that one out of the lineup. That was like picking out the early vanilla back in the day where you saw a little blushing on the head. But 
on the upside of this and what i want to get at is man look how cool it is like when we're doing like special in lace and redhead in spot nose in yellow belly in an animal and we're making tents um subtle genes are easier to stack because they don't dominate what you're doing too much so right now some of my favorite things in ball pythons are these really subtle traits being stacked on top of each other and then you go and put pastel in and then you get a white snake and that's just what i'm saying about pastel yeah yeah i love all the subtle stuff man i agree with you fully yeah no for sure you didn't catch on my pastel joke at the end there but hey you know what can you do um <laughs> Yeah. But um, yeah. So is 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 Jamie still just watching us? I, I saw some thumbs up pop up on the screen. I don't know what that was all about. I'm still that, learning. That, that pops up off the iPhones, bro. I don't know if I was him. I it was thumbs know. down though. It was thumbs down. It was multiple thumbs down. <laughs> it was psyching me out. <laughs> I don't know, man. I don't know. It came up on my screen. I I screened, so I think it was me. Okay. I I the iPhones are freaking weird, bro. Yeah, I saw it too. It was psyching me out. I thought it was MJ in the background just like taunting us or something. <laughs> yeah. Almost done. She's almost done. No, that's fine. This is going to be so that's much fun, fun man. So that's going to be good. Yeah. Well, well worth the wait, everybody. Oh, promise. Right. Give us one more question for the, you know, the OG OG and the OG. Okay. You're the um, real, real OG. Like a real OG? I'll be honest. I was reading that comment right there, and I was only kind of listening. Tell me this OG thing we're digging into. I'm a bad person. <laughs> no, you're you're an OG, man. You've been one of the game. 25? Oh, um, I got in around 2002, but like I said, I was always keeping. Um, but, you know, I will be honest. Um, MJ's comment last time we did a podcast about the faking it till you make it. Um, there's a big truth there with me like that those first years, man. I was just trying to weasel my way into conversations, weasel my way into the group hanging out afterwards. It took a long time before Dave was accepted. Um, yeah, but 2002, bro. 2002. Up, um, what it was like? Not, you started in 2002. I started in 2005. Okay, so cool, man. Pretty close. But, you, man, you hit it hard from the get-go. I was just chilling in the background. I was kind of fucking hiding and shit. So props to you, brother. It, you 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 say hit it hard though, but did I really hit it that hard? Producing a couple bows a year, like you know, it was I tiptoed hey. my way into it. Hey man, give yourself credit. When was your first show? Um, it was the very first Charlotte Repticon that was ever put on. Um, what year was that? Man, that might have been seven, might have been six. There, that's what I'm talking about, bro. Yeah. There you go. Give yourself some credit. Uh, you know what my company name was back then? What was that? Dave's Got Herps. <laughs> oh. Yeah, it's actually still my business name on my phone of classifieds. They must have fucked you all the time, bro. <laughs> well, here's the thing. If you knew Dave and his swagger over the years, that's a very true statement for a lot of people. They don't deny the fact that I could have herps. Um, <laughs> so... Yeah, it nobody really thought much about it. And it didn't right, affect my uh, business. I sold out. Behind. Here we go. Here's the first oh. one. Wait, wait, what's the prize though for the first one? Do we have to call prize oh, out? We first? Should start at the top, right? Start at the top. Oh, sea yeah. serpent track, buddy. Well, no, they're gonna pick. They're gonna pick, correct? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm stupid. My bad. My bad. Well, that one fell out, get that one. Okay, no, hold on. Let me pick it. <laughs> Here. All right, let's go. The first winner, my dog, Heathen Hatchery. Let's go. Woo -woo. <laughs> Where's Heathen Hatchery? Are you in the chat, big dog? If you are not in the chat, how do we do this? <laughs> well, let's give them 30 seconds, buddy. This is how game seconds. shows work. Brian, Heathen Hatchery. V unit member trapper from the state of florida oh someone's got a message this guy if somebody knows them let him know is this gonna was this a horrible idea <laughs> uh well he's a winner he's gonna have to you know we we got 30 seconds if uh he doesn't claim we have to go to the next one and he's 
he will be the last. Uh, he'll take the last uh, leftover. Uh, yeah, I mean, if he comes, if he comes out of the woodwork at any point here, I mean, just jump in pick. and let us know. Yeah, yeah. At any point, you jump in and get your pick, man. If we think yeah, this is gonna work, let's do that because we gotta get this one. Oh. Keep it rolling. All right, let's go. Number two, winner number two, Envision Morphs, Amber, V Unit member. All right, tick tock. Amber, are you in the chat? I'm going to call right now. If Amber's not here, man, we're just going to pull all eight names. We're going to do it in order. We're going to contact him afterwards, and we're going to let everyone know the prices and who picks what. If we go 0 for 2, man, I I think it's only fair. <laughs> yeah. Is that anticlimactic? Is this is this better for everybody? <laughs> I mean, I don't know. There's 82 people. Oh, there she is. There she all right. Is. There we go. Let's oh. go, Amber. What do you pick? You're going to have to announce it. <laughs> Waiting for you in the chat. Does she remember our picks? Is this this could be our fault? I I, I have a feeling I know what she's gonna pick. Oh, well, that's fine. And hey, everybody else, if you get your name pulled, when you jump in the comments, let us know what you're picking right away. Amber has number one. Amber, you have first pick. She picks the Canova card. Let's go. I knew there you that. go. I knew that. Put it out. All right, let's write that down. Congratulations, Amber. Congratulations. All right, let's keep it rolling. All right, number three, Nick. I hope I say I'm saying this correctly. Raider. R E H D E R. Are you in chat, Nick? You get second pick. Yeah, I'm so glad you're doing this. I'm really shitty at pronouncing names and reading them. Um, it'd be a hat job over here. All right. All right, Nick, are you in the chat? Do people know how to use the chat? Yeah, hey, he did the super chat, right? Shit. That's true. That's true. He's there. All right. Take Sea Serpent's wreck. He's going to take the Sea Serpent's wreck. Sweet. Cool, cool. Congratulations, Nick. That's fucking awesome. Thank you for the support. Hi. Right. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> Damn, Brian's a lucky one. Lucky son of a bitch. Ethan Hatchery again. Oh, I didn't think this was gonna happen. <laughs> <laughs> he must have. He must have went ape shit in the in the in the. Uh, this, yeah, he 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 put in some good money. Okay. Anybody got this guy's phone number? I'm feeling bad now. Yeah. Hey, somebody in the chat. Somebody in the V unit. Call call uh, Brian, please. All right, and then we got the homie JMG Reptiles. Oh shit! Junior. The Hog Nose King. That's exciting. JMG, are you in the chat, brother? Jeff better be here right now, or otherwise he's not a friend. <laughs> Hog bless. He's on there. Oh. Hog bless. The hell does that mean, Jay? What does that mean, Junior? <laughs> <laughs> What's my choices? Oh, oh. oh, come on, man. Well, you could go with you could go with a thousand dollars in roaches and a four by two by two enclosure. Um, you can do a you could be on a Monday night breeder. What do, what do you guys call the Monday night again? A new breeder. Hey, you, yeah, you, you want to be a new breeder on the block with us? You can be a new breeder on a block day. on a Monday. Nah, the Canova card's taken, brother. No card's taken. You're not even in ball pythons, yeah. bro. What are you doing? <laughs> hey, JMG ain't getting no ball pythons. Come on now. Um, I mean, we still got um Troy's donation for his five dollar gift, five hundred dollar gift card. If um JMG wants some ball pythons, <laughs> Troy, man, he'll take the enclosure and roaches. Enclosure from Dubia and roaches. That was smart, man. You're gonna use those roaches. Awesome. All right, we got the next one. Another V Unit member, Kenneth, All City Serpents. Ken, are you in the chat? 
Oh, so we got Run It Reptiles gift card still. What do we got left, man? Let's name it off. We got the we podcast. We got the Bellerino Reptiles 2024 gift card. 2020? Uh, 2024. Um, we have uh, D Exotics and Hardwired's 500. 500. We have the artwork. So yeah, we put that Adeline's artwork. I think that's it. We have Tiki's. We have Tiki's uh, gargoyles. Tiki's geckos. Holy crap! We've done nothing yet. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I hope I'm not missing anything. I know the chat knows what's there. It, the I'm Monday pretty... new breeder on the block episode with the big dog MJ. That's called. Cool. All right, are we getting ahead of ourselves here? I'm not really sure. I'm trying to find a pen. All right, Ken. Ken isn't in the chat, so Ken's gonna have to be left for later. Okay. So we've got, we've got what three? We have six people already picked, and then one is Dubia Canova. No, but what do we have that have what? What do we have? Of members yep. that are not in the chat, that that stuff that's been that it, they've been selected, but they haven't selected. Heathen hatchery twice and all city service. All right, so we have people. three uh gifts we have to save already yeah well what we'll do is um at the end whoever's not here we'll reach out so we'll let everybody know who won what all right and we have what five in total left yes we got hardwire um we discussed we got um uh, running right. reptiles we got tiki we got your gift card and and monday. and monday we have five and the podcast yep and okay, so we got so two we more picks only... okay we can only select two more yeah, so we got five left. All right, now we got balloons. You see that? <laughs> All right, V unit member, my dog, Magic City Pythons, JC. JC, I know you ain't sleeping. I hope not. I, I know you're awake, dog. JC, come on now. <laughs> come on, Friday, the Pride and Joy of Miami Day. Miami Dade, the 305. Where you at? Ooh. I know this man ain't sleeping. All City Serpents is putting question marks, so they're in now. All right, All City Serpents is here. All right, he gets to select. Kenneth, you get to select, bro. We got 500 bucks from Hardwire. We got that red striped gargoyle from Tiki. We got 250 for Run It Reptiles auction with t-shirts. We got the podcast on Monday night. And I'm and we got your card for a 2024 animal, $200 gift card. What will it be? What you got, Ken? Let's go. Dead air. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. <laughs> oh. Yo, Kenneth. All city. One. I'm about to skip you, dog. Come on now. He's there, though, right? That's you my homie. Yeah, he put yeah he's here. Okay. Do you need to hear what's available? Say yes or no. So we can make this a little faster. So we have one more name after this. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna just repeat what's available. We have D Exotics and Hardwired's gift card for five hundred. We have Villarino Reptiles gift card for two hundred, going towards twenty twenty four production. We have the artwork. Okay. We have Tiki Gecko's Gargoyle, and we have the Monday Night New Breeder on the Block episode with the man, the myth, the legend, MJ. The Savage. The Savage. The Savage. <laughs> <laughs> oh, artwork. <laughs> Somebody said the artwork. <laughs> 
said the R word? No, uh, no everyone's it's... picking the R word for him. Yeah, <laughs> he, he's um he's on dialogue, like someone said. <laughs> All right, Ken. I, Ken, we you gotta, gotta pick that pick that last ten name. Ten, Ken, you got ten seconds, bro. Kenneth, yes. It's you, Kenneth. <laughs> Funny guy. All City Serpents, I need you to select your gift, please. Thank you. My dog. That's why I'm being so patient right now. Oh. What's the sixth one? Give me a minute, Derek. Uh, we have uh, we have some people that haven't selected, so we, we'll figure that out right now. All right, Kenneth, you're going to have to pick later. How many do we have to pick for picking later? We have Heathen Hatchery twice, Magic City Pythons, and All City Serpents. That's four. That's and you four. have number eight in your hand. All right. And guess who was picked again? I better not be Junior. No. Is it Kenneth? Yes, please. What? I don't get it. I'm getting lost here. Ken, Kenneth, you're going to have to text me later, bro. All right. Heathen Hatchery is selected again. Son of a bitch. <laughs> yes. So he's got three. He's got three selections. Okay. So in total, we have now that have to be selected later. Three. We have three for people. Brian. Three for Brian, one for Magic City, and one for All City. All right. So we have five. Yeah. And Derek says there's six gifts. So still, we to, yeah, we need to figure this out right now. Which one do we forget? Uh, I'm not sure. So, Canova got claimed. Sea Serpent got let's, claimed. Let's, let's, hold on. Let's write oh. this down. I got it right here. <laughs> oh, you got it? Okay. So Scratch. is Derek wrong? Well, Doobie has been selected. Canova has been selected. You picked the gargoyle. All City Serpents. All City the Serpents picked the gargoyle. Okay, tight. So that's off the list. Right on time, bro. Good job. So we just have um, Magic City Pythons and Heathen Hatchery. Three for so we have yeah. four Left. outstanding to be picked. Is that okay? What has? So, what do you have left, Dave? Um. I got your donation. I've got Hardwire's donation. I've got Run It Rough Tiles $250 towards their auction donation. And I've got an episode on Monday night. Whoever wants to guess, be a guest. And, art, and I think it's going to. And the artwork. And the artwork. Okay. So we need one more name. Okay. Derek, Derek was right. Big D. <laughs> That's my fault. I should know better. I put this together. I have no hey, idea what's going on. We're, we're just trying our best here, bro. It yeah. better not be him again. You throw that name away if it is. Oh, shit. Another B unit member. The, oh. the Cuban Japanese. My dog from Miami. Josine Storm. We call him Josh. Magic okay. City Pythons picked the Villarino gift card. Who? Magic City Pythons. Magic City picked Villarino gift the card. Villarino gift card. Off the list. And now we got uh, Josh, Storm Man from the 305. Man, this you you lucky, bro. You want some Canova snakes, and now now you win the you know the he raffle here. Hardwire. He wants hardwired uh, gift card. Hardwired, tight. Great choice. Keep building that collection, brother. So he then just gets what's left. All right, so he then gets everything that's left. I mean, I, it's pretty good, though. He gets a guest appearance on an episode on Monday. He gets some badass artwork. If you don't want it, buddy, I'll give you store credit for that artwork. And um, run it reptile auctions. Here we go, man. That's not that bad. Yeah, man. This was a lot of fun. And uh, I got to give uh, I gotta give us and MJ a round of applause because, uh, man, uh yes there was some little technical difficulties in the beginning i went a little long i got ahead of myself i got excited i was nervous i just started rambling uh but this was amazing man 
uh, a team effort. Um, I got to thank my wife also for helping. Um, and uh, man, great ideas, Dave. And, you know, we put our minds together and we did something amazing tonight. Yeah, loved it. I, I loved hearing the papers flipping in the background in your intro, buddy. Um, love the ambience. I, mean, I really mean it. You heard you heard the papers for real? Every single paper I heard it. Every uh, You wrote like two words on a sheet of paper and flipped it over, apparently. Bro. <laughs> <laughs> hey, guys, I got to give it to MJ. While I know he's been doing this a long time and anyone that's doing a podcast out there, this is not easy. This is not easy easy we got to give these guys their flowers we got to give mj his flowers this is not easy nope takes a rhythm man takes a while it's nice just be able to show up and have no responsibilities every once in a while yeah oh definitely man definitely (laughs) for real but well Uh, congratulations to all the winners um enjoy your uh your prizes and uh you know Thank you for all the support tonight. Uh, Dave, what do you have to say to everyone out there that supports you, bro? Um, same as always. I really do appreciate you guys coming out tonight. You know, I'm glad we got this all together. Um, you know, I've always really wanted to talk to Phil Goss. I think he's a great guy in the hobby. Loved hearing from Elizabeth. Um, you know, like I said, his face I haven't seen in a long time. And, um, yeah, it's a bigger and better things, guys. we got a lot coming up like every other year. Let's um, let's get together and get some shit done. And, and real quick, man, guys do you know really help us help us help us keep everything keep everything legal keep our passion going all of us all of us every single one of us let's 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 join this fight and keep it going um you know thank you for all the support um thank you for supporting uh mj my dog uh let's wish him a speedy recovery you know you know he's gonna be working the animals real soon uh, I think everyone's holding him back right now. I think uh, Lily might have him like tied up to the bed right now where he can't even work his animals. So, uh, you know, he's itching right now to go go check out his all his chondros and his emeralds and all this stuff. So uh, thank you for all the support, MJ. And uh, it's a wrap. Uh, thank you all. And you guys have a great night. Well, later, guys.